Sergeants, uh, you can begin your recording. PC recording is running. Cloud recording is on. Mr. Chair, you ready to get started? Yes. All right, then Mr. Sakim, if you could take us away. Yes. Good afternoon and welcome to today's New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Finance. At this time, would all panelists please turn on your videos. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or in silent mode. If you wish to test to submit a testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, as testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin, Chair. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on Finance. My name is Daniel Drum and I'm the chair of this committee. We have been joined by Majority Leader Matteo and Council Members Adams, Grudenchik, Powers, Amphrey Samuel, Lewis, and Rosenthal. Today, the committee will be holding a hearing on three topics. First, oversight of the city's November 2020 financial plan update. Second, a pre-considered introduction sponsored by Council Member Adams by request of the mayor related to the city's tax lien sale. Third, introduction 2046 sponsored by Council Member Lander related to the capital commitment plan and capital project detail data reports. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special welcome to the new director of the Office of Management and Budget, Jacques Gia, who is testifying for this, before this committee for the first time in his new role. I've had the pleasure of working closely with Director Gia in his prior position as the Commissioner of Finance, and I look forward to continuing our productive relationship now that he assumed leadership of OMB. I'll start with an overview of the November financial plan. The fiscal 2021 budget as of the November plan is $92 billion, which is 3.8 billion more than the fiscal 21 budget at adoption. Most of this increase is from the recognition of $2.7 billion in federal COVID reimbursements. The budget gaps for the out years, I'm sorry, um, remain sizable with the fiscal 2022 gap standing at $3.8 billion. This gap must be closed by the release of the preliminary budget in January. New needs for fiscal 2021 total $650.6 million, of which $401.8 million is for the Department of Education and the projected budgeted headcount is modestly reduced in each year of the plan by approximately 500 to 1,000 positions each year. Today, we have questions about what is included in the plan, but we also hope to learn more about issues that are not laid out in the budget documents. New York City has a reputation for proactive budgeting, namely budgets that try to present an accurate estimate of spending and revenues across the plan period. We don't see that happening in this financial plan. In particular, this financial plan does not make a lot of movement towards addressing the many issues the city is facing as a result of COVID. For example, the plan shows minimal progress towards closing the budget gap for fiscal 2022. It does not address the severe and catastrophic problems facing the city's small businesses, nor does it show the complete cost changes reflective of the new way schools have had to teach this year. It similarly does not make any adjustments for increased state risks to the budget. We hope that through today's testimony and questions, we can shed light on those issues, as well as gain more clarity on the $656.7 million savings from labor agreements that the administration has announced since adoption. Turning to the lien sale, the pre-considered intro that is being heard today is being introduced by request of the mayor and is sponsored by council member Adams. The bill requests that the council extend the authority for the city to sell liens for an additional four years, 
and would also exempt certain COVID-19 impacted class one homeowners from the 2021 lien sale. I will let council member Adams speak in more detail on this bill, but before I turn it over to her, I'll note that I know that the administration feels very strongly that the lien sale authority be renewed. They contend it is an important enforcement tool to prevent property tax, water debt, and certain emergency housing repair change delinquency. I also recognize, however, that for many years, the council has been advocating for reforms to the lien sale, in particular to blunt its negative impact on low-income homeowners and communities of color. I hope that as we continue to negotiate changes to the lien sale program and engage in vigorous debate about its future, that we are able to strike the right balance between those interests and find a path that satisfies the many interested parties. So with a very happy birthday to council member Adams, I'll now pass it over to her to speak about this issue. Council member Adams. Okay, I think I'm finally allowed to, allowed to unmute. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you um, so much uh, for the birthday shout out. I appreciate that. So good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to start once again by thanking Chair Drum for allowing me to deliver remarks. I wanna make it clear what this hearing is and what it is not. During today's hearing, we will discuss pre-considered introduction T2020-6944 in relation to the sale of tax liens. It is important for everyone to understand how we got here and what this bill means. Simply stated, this legislation is a placeholder based on verbiage suggested by the, admin, by the administration. This was necessary in order for today's hearing to proceed so that all voices are heard and are on the record. We all know that from its inception, the lien sale has been rife with injustices which disproportionately impact communities of color. I have always been an advocate for change to this process and that has not and will not change. I didn't forget overnight that the lien sale incentivizes predatory behavior. I didn't forget that I have resided next door to a foreclosed property for almost 15 years. I did not turn my back on the fact that the current lien sale model continues to increase the racial wealth gap and undermine home stability in our city. My commitment to protect and preserve low to moderate income home ownership in our city still stands. Negotiations are ongoing and will not stop until we get to a palatable bill that changes the way that our city collects outstanding debt. So with that, I wanna thank the governor for his executive order to pause the lien sale. I wanna thank all of the advocates and CBOs for your tireless work, your knowledge, your commitment, and your compassion to the cause of equitable housing for all New Yorkers. And I look forward to your testimony. We have a long way to go. And this legislation continues to evolve. In the next phase of negotiations with the administration, I hope to further a partnership, not only with people on the ground, but also with my colleagues, so that the final product will make lasting and positive change for New York. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Adams. We have been joined by Council Member Joni and Gibson. And uh, lastly, we have intro 2046, sponsored by Council Member Lander, which would make clarifying changes to the city charter's language regarding the requirements and timelines of producing the triannual capital commitment plans and the capital project detail data reports. We will now hear testimony from Jacques Gia, the director of OMB, Director Gia is joined by Kenneth Godner, the first deputy budget director, Vincent Sapienza, the commissioner of the Department of Environmental Protection, Joseph Morin, the chief financial officer of the Department of Environmental Protection, and Jeffrey Sheard, deputy commissioner of the Department of Finance. Before we hear from them, I will ask Stephanie Ruiz, the committee counsel, 
to give some procedural instructions and then swear in the witnesses. Uh, Stephanie. Thank you, Chair. I'm Stephanie Ruiz, Council of the City's Council's Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the Zoom host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called on, as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. We'll first hear testimony from the administration, which will be followed by questions from the council members, followed by members of the public. I will now administer the oath. Please ra raise your right hands. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, Mr. Jihad? Yes. Mr. Godner? I do. Mr. Sapienza? I do. Mr. Murren? I do. And Mr. Sear? I do. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Drum. And uh, for the kind words, and I'm I'm also looking forward to working with you in the months ahead. And I also want to thank members of the finance committee and members of the city council for the opportunity to testify today concerning the fiscal year 2021 November financial plan modification and the tax incentive reauthorization. My name is uh, Jacques Shiha and I'm the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Management and Budget. I'm joined today by OMB First Deputy Director, Ken Gardner, Vincent Sapienza, the Commissioner of DEP, Jeff Shear, uh, a DOF a Deputy Commissioner. Following the pause implemented last spring, the city's economy and revenue collapsed overnight. We revised down our tax revenue projections by $9 billion. Meanwhile, the city had to spend billions of unplanned and unbudgeted dollars to deal with the pandemic. If you were not for the record reserves built by this administration and the council and the saving we achieved, the city could not have dealt with the sharp decline in revenue without substantial cuts to vital services and major layoffs. So sound fiscal management will remain key to our fiscal recovery plan. This means making cautious revenue estimates, remain focused on savings and building and maintaining reserves. The November, the November plan reflects a continuation of this strategy. The fiscal year 2021 budget is $92 billion and remains balanced. It is $3.8 billion above the budget adopted in June. Budget growth is primarily driven by FEMA reimbursable costs and other federal COVID relief grants that the city used to save lives and keep New Yorkers healthy and safe. We also invested in reopening school, schools, which is not only great for children and parents, but also a crucial step in safely reopening the city's economy. The other driver of the budget growth is higher than expected tax revenue. While cities, uh, recall, while cities revenue have declined as the economy supported, the city avoided deeper declines in tax revenue collections because of the beneficial effects of the first round of the federal stimulus which included unemployment benefits, tax rebate checks, and business loans. Specifically, the budget recognized $748 million in, in better than expected collections, primarily in personal income and business taxes, which are offset by a decline in non-tax revenue for a total change of $613 million. We have also achieved the largest November two-year savings plan of this administration, $1.3 billion, that completely offsets new city spending of just under $780 million in those same years. We will build on these savings throughout the year. At adoption, 
the mayor committed to achieving $1 billion in annual labor savings as a gap closing measure. Since June, the administration has reached just over $720 million for the current fiscal year. This includes furloughs of all 9,500 managerial and non represented city employees, which has saved $20 million. We'll continue to work with labor unions to identify savings that help balance the city's budget. Another pillar of strong fiscal management is building and maintaining reserves. In the November plan, we maintained $2.8 billion in this fiscal year. And for the first time, the city will have a true winning day fund. I appreciate your partnership in providing another tool that strengthens the city's financial management, which has a balance of nearly $500 million. As we proceed to the preliminary budget, it is important to recognize the headwinds we face from Washington and Albany. While COVID spending has ramped up to more than $5.2 billion, federal support has been insufficient and is actually lessening. FEMA recently changed its policies to restrict reimbursable activities. For instance, the agency has refused to fund PPE for teachers and additional disinfection necessary to allow schools to reopen safely. Federal changes are not only limited to new costs, but also some costs incurred at the height of the emergency. Further, the federal government will not support certain uh, proactive safety measures, which complicates preparation for a second wave. These changes put $350 million to a $1 billion at risk. Stimulus from Washington was a crucial lifeline to New Yorkers that provided more than $40 billion in unemployment benefits, rebate checks, and business loans. We are optimistic that further federal stimulus is likely with the incoming Biden administration, though the timing and size is unknown. Step taken to manage COVID increase the state already troubled financial condition. Facing a $14.9 billion gap in its current fiscal year, Albany has threatened severe cuts to localities. We could lose billions of dollars used to educate our children and fund safety net programs <clears throat> for the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Another risk we are facing is a slowing economic recovery. Monthly private sector job growth has declined steadily from a high of 105,000 jobs in June to about 14,000 jobs in October. But despite these serious risks, we are making steady progress toward recovery and a vaccine is on the horizon. We will continue to push the city towards recovery because when activity resumes, we will be stronger and more resilient than ever before. Before I conclude, I want to address the city's tax lien sale. This is a very difficult issue for New Yorkers, the city council and the administration. People are struggling and no one wants to add to the pain and challenges that they face, in particular during this pandemic. That is why we are working with you to create a new fairer program to help property owners who are facing difficult times. We have had robust conversation already with some of you about concerns regarding the debt threshold, the income eligibility threshold for PTAs, the breadth of outreach, and the challenges that homeowners face trying to navigate the system generally. We are committed to working with you to address these issues as we go to the legislative process. We also know that in this pandemic, people are finding, finding it much harder to get by. That is why our proposed legislation include COVID relief for homeowners. And it is our goal to apply this broadly and with compassion. We find no pleasure in putting anyone's poverty in the lean cell, which we see 
as a last resort. The very last resort that we turn to only after we have used every tool at our disposal and have tried everything that we can to avoid. Before a property is put on the lien sell list, we conduct extensive outreach to contact the homeowners and help them avoid a bigger problem. The, city goal, the city's goal is to advise New Yorkers of their rights and give them the opportunities to resolve the lien before the property is on the lien sale list when it is too late. Every property owner is sent five notices of an impending lien. The first is a pre-notice letter sent four months before the property is placed in a tax lien sale. Owners are then given a range of options and advised to call the Department of Finance immediately. If there is no reply, we send four more notices before a lien is filed. If someone cannot make payments due to extenuating circumstances, we will work with them to design a flexible payment plan that meets their individual needs. We offer two primary options to help eligible homeowners repay outstanding taxes. Our standard, our standard payment plan requires zero down and allows property owners to stretch the payment out for up to 10 years. For those homeowners who are facing serious challenges, we work with the council to create the PT aid program, which allows qualifying owners to defer the property taxes and remain in their homes. Additionally, DOF, the Department of Finance recently began offering an option for all property owners to pay their taxes monthly instead of quarterly or semi-annually in order to help participating homeowners to better manage their finances. Taken together, these payment options seek to help our city homeowners manage through difficult times while ensuring that we are able to collect the revenue to provide the vital services that our communities depend on. In sum, <clears throat> we work very hard to avoid lien sales. But without renewing the lien sale authority, the, suit, the city loses a critical enforcement tool that encourages the prompt payment of municipal charges. We need these funds to deliver the quality program and services New Yorker need and expect, like pre-K for all, street and sidewalk cleaning, snow removal, trash collection, and so on. As I discussed earlier, the city faces many challenges. Failure to renew the lien sale authority could cause additional harm by damaging our fiscal health and jeopardizing our credit ratings. We understand and share the council commitment to protecting struggling homeowners and making sure that the city has resources it needs to fund critical program and services. In light of this, we appreciate your partnership in creating a new COVID protection program for the 2021 lien sale and respectfully request your support. Finally, we support the legislation and 2046 and we look forward to working with you on it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to continuing the dialogue in the months to come as we work together to bring New York City back stronger and fairer than ever before. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Gia. Uh, before we move on to questions, I just want to say that we have been joined by council members Van Bramer, Moya, Ayala, Kumbo, and Cornegie. And uh, Director uh, Gia, corona case, uh, coronavirus cases are surging again in the city and state, and there's a fear that the holidays could potentially lead to a spike come next year. 
while the infection and hospitalization rates remain lower in the city compared to upstate as of December 7th, Governor Cuomo warned that there would be another shutdown if hospitals become overwhelmed again. What risks does a significant surge in cases and a possible shutdown pose to the revenue plan and the need for additional related city funded spending? Is any of this risk related uh, reflected in the November plan? Well, um, there is a risk that the, um, that the economy may slow down as a result of a possible partial shutdown. But the November plan only recognize, recognizes tax collection actually received in the first quarter of 2021. Going forward, we remain focused on savings. We are also stressing the need for additional federal aid. If that doesn't materialize, we will need to consider difficult budget decisions. So you have a plan to deal with the impact after another shutdown? Uh, and what the impact would be on in terms of our revenues? Well, as I said, if, uh, you know, if uh, there is, you know, at this point in time, no one knows for sure what's going to happen. But if there is a potential shutdown or partial shutdown of the economy, there is like there's a likelihood that, uh, um, you know, the economy may slow. In which case, as I said, we will continue to push for federal aid. And if that doesn't materialize, we will have uh, to make some very tough uh, budget decisions. Okay, so what I'm hearing is basically that we desperately need that federal aid in order to move forward. Uh, should we have, well, we need it anyway, no matter what, but I think that we would need it even more should we face another shutdown. Yep, that's, yep. that's correct. Okay, the fiscal 21 adopted budget had a million dollar placeholder for un unspecified labor savings. After the budget was adopted, the administration announced agreements with the labor unions to save $657.7 million, largely by moving planned fiscal 21 payments into fiscal 22. If the payments still need to be made in fiscal 22, can these really be called a savings or is this just kicking the, uh, the can down the road? Well, from my perspective, uh, these uh, deferral agreements provide the city with approximately $722 million of cash flow relief uh, in fiscal year 2021. So from, you know, you could say from the city perspective, even though we're gonna uh, uh, have to basically uh, uh, recognize those expenses in 2022, but given the situation, the financial difficulty the city was uh, dealing with in fiscal year 2021, when no one knew for sure what was gonna happen. So it was, you know, it was uh, in our best interest, basically, to try to maximize as much cash that we have in the bank as possible to meet our obligations on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Director, also, um, uh, the, the um, adopted budget assumed a one billion dollar savings, um, and uh, the plan. What's the plan then to um, achieve the remaining? I guess it's three hundred and forty-two point two million in savings. Um, you've, re you've spoken about 657.7 million, but what about that remaining 342.2 million? We continue to, uh, to work with the, uh, uh, our labor union partners, you know, to achieve uh, and meet the uh, FY21 uh, saving targets that we have. So, so you're looking to see a further yeah. savings from labor, labor agreements? Labor unions, yes. And that would equal the, the, um, the $1 billion? Exactly. Okay, so uh, in terms of the federal stimulus, the November plan recognized more than $2.2 billion in federal COVID-19 related funding for fiscal 21. In addition, there is bipartisan Congress, uh, coronavirus aid package currently under consideration by Congress. According to the Washington Post, the package would allocate about $160 billion in aid to states and localities if enacted. Senator Schumer has described the package as COVID relief rather than a stimulus. So first, can you break down the 2.2 billion in federal COVID funding that was included in the plan? Uh, it's actually $2.8 billion that we include in the plan. Uh, FEMA accounts for $1.5 billion and stimulus is about $1.3 billion. Okay, and can you describe the importance of the city receiving the federal aid 
Um, and do you currently have any estimates on how much the city could get from this package? I mean, as I indicated to you before, uh, uh, you know, um, we all trying to avoid making uh, painful uh, choice, some painful choices. And to the extent that we could secure federal funding, federal aid, it would uh, be very, very, very useful, very helpful for the New York City, for, for the city and for the city economy in general, because uh, uh, stimulus is a great uh, uh, way to stimulate the city's economy, to speed up the city's economy, the city's recovery. Uh, as far as uh, we don't have any estimate at this point in time, because we don't have the detail uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the bill. So as we get more information, we're more than happy to share them with you. And thank you, uh, Director. Um, let's talk a little bit about school technology. The November sure. plan doesn't add any funding to the DOE's budget for technology to support remote instruction. And the five-year capital plan amendment does not propose an increase to the total five-year $750 million budget for all technology that had been set prior to the pandemic. Um, the DOE reportedly spent more than $530 million on iPads in the spring alone. So what is the total fiscal 2021 budget for school technology, including devices and services related to remote learning, broken down by expense and capital spending? Um, so far, we have approved nearly uh, $200 million in capital and about $200 million in expense to support uh, remote learning. Uh, and uh, I should also say that I uh, mentioned to you that uh, um, the expense funds are basically supported by federal dollars. To date, we have approved uh, about 461,000 uh, devices, and we continue to work with the agency as they continue to identify on meta demand. Commissioner, why doesn't the November plan show changes related to the remote learning technology? Uh, we receive about uh, $60 million in federal CD funding, which will reflect in the budget. Which will what? Will be reflected in the budget. Okay. Um, uh, where's the addition for internet connectivity in family shelters? Is that in the budget? We don't see that. It's, uh, it will be reflected. We, we, we're currently reviewing uh, uh, this, uh, this proposal, and it will be reflected in the general financial plan. Okay. Okay. Um, um, how much funding will it take to ensure that all students and teachers are properly equipped with both devices and internet service? Well, we have made uh, funding uh, on these uh, devices a priority. And I can assure you that we are leveraging our buying power as a major city as much as possible. And, um, you know, so to uh, you know, our goal is basically to provide every single one of the students and teachers all the equipment and technology that they need to continue to educate our children. So is there a budgeted amount or you just will make sure that everybody gets what they need? And, then... and we'll make sure as, as, the, as, the, as the, the demand, as the request coming, we we'll review them and make sure they approve them because this is a priority for us. So as the as the need arises, you'll you'll move forward. We'll okay. review and and make sure that uh, they have resources available. Okay, let me just talk a little bit about the um, NYPD budget. The budget was adopted with an agreement between the mayor and the council to reduce the NYPD's budget by one billion. However, the adopted budget only showed a reduction of four hundred and twenty million for fiscal twenty one, and eighty two million for fiscal twenty two. Furthermore, the November plan actually adds to the NYPD budget and doesn't show additional reductions. So why are the reductions that, are that were negotiated as part of the fiscal 21 budget deal not fully reflected in the city's budget? Uh, as you know, these uh, transfers are very complicated. And, uh, you know, the mayor made it clear uh, last, uh, last year, I mean, that uh, the SSA was a two-year process and that uh, we would work uh, um, that and that uh, SCG and traffic could be done this year. Uh, those operational just, just to clarify, the SSA is the uh, school safety agents and the SG yes. is the uh, school crossing guards, SCG. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, those operational discussions have begun and we are not holding up those uh, pending uh, the budget transfers 
and that when we have the contours of that outcome, we'll reflect those changes in the financial plan that follows. In 22? In 22. Okay. Once we have you know, the contours of uh, the outcome of uh, the negotiation. So we're still committed to those changes? We're still committed. We're still committed. You know, as I said, it's a, it's a, it's a complicated process. But uh, as a discussion, uh, 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 you know, get to an end and we have a better sense of uh, what's involved, you know, would, they would be affected in the coming of, in the financial plan coming. And Director, do you plan. know if negotiations in terms of the transfer of that funding has begun or the training that's necessary to move them over, particularly the school safety agents? Discussion are taking place at this point in time. And, uh, and I, as I said, once we have a better sense of where things are, they will be reflected in the, uh, in the financial plan. Okay. Uh, let me go move on now to uh, some lean sale questions, and I'm going to open it up to my colleagues. Sure. Um, several years ago, the council passed my legislation establishing the BT aid uh, program. This program provides more flexible and affordable payment plan options for property owners who have fallen behind in their tax bills. You mentioned, I think, some of the um, options that uh, folks have. Uh, can you provide the committee an update on the number of people enrolled in the PTA program? Yeah, uh, the, uh, currently we have about uh, 187 people enrolled in the program. You know, and uh, we, I, I believe the Department of Finance is doing the best that they can to, uh, uh, to address a lot of the concerns uh, the public has and that basically stop them from participating in the program. One, one of which is the income threshold, which is a little bit too low, okay? Because, you know, it's hard to uh, for someone in New York City to own a home and earn an income of like $53,000, you know, close to $54,000. So, we so we're working with the council to see what to do to basically raise that income threshold so to allow more people to participate in the program. That threshold now is at 58,400, am I correct? 400, yes. Yes, something like that, yeah. Plus, yeah. All right, so we look forward to continuing to work with you on that as well. Definitely, definitely. It's a very, very solid program, and I think uh, it would uh, provide a lot of relief to a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Uh, the PTA enrolls, uh, enrollees pay the uh, exact same penalty interest as property owners who are delinquent on their property taxes and not working with the city to address outstanding debt. Other tax jur uh, jurisdictions, including the IRS, provide partial relief from penalties when taxpayers enter payment plans and stay current on those plans. Would the city consider doing the same for low and middle income property owners in the PT aid um, or even the regular payment plans? Um, you're talking about the penalties or you're talking about the interest? The interest. Or the interest. Uh, the, and the, interest sorry. The, the interest is already low at 5%. Okay. Uh, and uh, the challenge that we have, we've been dealing with uh, a law and our lawyers have been looking to these issues. And uh, it's um, it's very difficult to have different interest rate for PT aid than other simulated, uh, similarly situated uh, properties. So we continue to look into it but uh, there are some legal challenges that we have to overcome. Okay, so again, we'd like to work with you on that as we move forward yes, also to, to see what we can do there. Um, was it, was it, okay, um, so let's go to a timeline now. Traditionally, the lean sale process begins in February with the 90 day notice being mailed out and mostly ends around mid-May with the last day to pay. Um, do you expect the city to keep that timeline if it gets reauthorization? Um, let me begin by stating that uh, we are not doing a lean sale for 2020. However, we do want to have the ability to do the lean sale next year with, uh, you know, with, like I indicated earlier, with board COVID protections so that we could remove uh, certain people who are impacted by COVID from the lean sale. So again, as I said, um, we're still working with the council, so we could, you know, address issues with respect to timeline and so on and so forth. But uh, at this point in time, I don't have a definite uh, 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 timeline timeline in terms of exactly when it's going to happen. Okay, it's a so lot we have to coordinate to make sure that. Uh, but we do want to have your authority uh, to do it next year. Okay, because February is what just a few months away, so we need to. 
to work quickly on that, I think. Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, if there's a further spike in COVID cases and the city goes into lockdown again, would that impact your timeline as well? Well, we're trying to, that's what we're trying to come up with, uh, you know, because not if, we, you know, if uh, if there's a lockdown, not everyone is impacted by COVID per se. I mean, everybody's impacted by COVID, but not everybody individually, you know, is impacted so that in terms of their income, their ability to pay. So that's why we're trying to, as much as we can, to come up with uh, COVID protections to so that we make sure we could remove anyone that is impacted by COVID from the lean cell. And, and Director, do you have any idea, you mentioned the governor's, um, uh, you know, the uh, the moratorium on the uh, lean sales. Do you um, have any idea um, how long he'll continue to extend the portion of the um, EO prohibiting the lean sales? Uh, I don't have uh, uh, any sense of uh, when, uh, the, you know, what the governor is doing in terms of uh, the timeline. Um, uh, however, uh, we believe that uh, uh, we cannot have a lapse in the lean cell authority. And for the simple reason that it would send uh, the wrong signal because many property owners would decide not to pay or to delay their payments, okay? Because they, they would not, they, there would not be any ramification for them if they don't pay. And as a result, that's, this would affect significantly the financial uh, situation of the city. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, so let me leave it like that at this point then, um, uh, Director. And I'm gonna to go to uh, council member questions. I believe that's where we're going to head now. And I'll turn it back over to Stephanie Rui, our council to call on members. Okay. Thank you, sir. We have questions by council member Gibson followed by council member Adams. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum and my colleagues and everyone who's on today's hearing. Uh, thank you so much, Director, and congratulations on your new position. We're looking thank forward you. to working with you as you oversee uh, the Office of Management and Budget and certainly a lot of the financial challenges that we confront as a city. So I have uh, two very quick questions. And as you know, I chair the subcommittee on capital. So we've been working very closely with OMB around the whole capital commitment plan and the uh, capital process itself. So I wanted to ask, with the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, we've seen uh, changes to the city's capital budget and the capital process. Um, after the pause was lifted from the state, we struggled with cash flow issues, uh, which unfortunately delayed many of our ongoing capital projects. Uh, I wanted to understand, while many of our capital projects are paid for with bond sales that the city actually uh, sells, um, can you give us an update on where we are in terms of there being a delay between the outlay of funds for capital projects and the actual sale of bonds? Uh, what bond issuances have been initiated uh, from the city since the pandemic began? Well, since, um, I mean, I, I mean, let me give, take first a uh, shot at it, but uh, since March, uh, uh, since March, the city has issued like two uh, geo transactions for new money and refunding purposes, totaling about like uh, $2.3 billion. We also had like four TFA uh, uh, secret transaction for new money and refunding for about $4.7 billion. And uh, we uh, also have um, a transitional financing authority building aid revenue bond issued approximately $350 million for new money and uh, reoffering purposes. And I also believe that uh, uh, the uh, Water Finance Authority has issued three transactions for new money and refunding for about $1.8 billion. Okay, so in terms of uh, some of the bonds that have been issued, what does that mean and what is the oversight that OMB is providing to many of our agencies uh, that have delayed capital projects? Uh, some agencies, some of the capital projects were in design, the design stopped, 
some started construction, everything stopped. So I want to understand from your perspective, what is the guidance that OMB is giving to a number of our agencies? How do we prioritize these projects? Many of us have new housing projects that we want to get started. We have new schools in our districts and a lot of these things have been stalled. So how do we prioritize agency by agency on what's most important based on the financing that we have at this time? Yeah, um, all, at, at this time, I would say to you, all active construction projects have been restarted, but it provides you more detail. Let me have a can, Gardner, provide you, you know, some more detailed information. But uh, okay. as far as, as, as this point in time, all active construction projects have restarted. Ken? Okay. Ken? Yeah, no, I'm sorry. They they had to unmute. Okay. 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 Um, as as Director Gia mentioned, um, all of our active construction projects, which were stopped uh, during the initial pause, were uh, were restarted. Um, since then, we've intentionally uh, taken a deliberate approach to the remaining capital projects. First, uh, we prioritize and pass through um projects that have impact on safety and health and and we're letting those go through uh as quickly as we can the the rest of the projects we are uh triaging and and we are it is it, it's not accidental we are deliberately going through the projects slowing down the the pace of capital spending until we get a better um fuller understanding of the financial situation uh and after that, we, we can decide on on pacing based on the information that we get. You're on mute, council member. I, I'm sorry, you're on mute, council member. Sorry about that. Um, and I appreciate you saying that, Ken, thank you. So I guess my question is, as we prioritize a lot of these projects based on what the financing looks like now, I agree health, wellness, and safety is important, but you also recognize that housing is important too because of the thousands of families that are living in temporary housing today. During a COVID, uh, we have to get them into long-term housing. So I'm grateful that we recognize that and HPD's money, instead of being shifted in the outer years, uh, there's about $477 million that we are moving up uh, into the, the next fiscal years. That's a good thing and that's a start, but I'm not accepting that as enough. Um, yeah, I, I just wanna- guys Because it's important to do. I appreciate that. I just wanted to point out that there's no HPD projects that are currently stalled or held up. So uh, that is that is from HPD. So um, yeah, we will work with you and make sure that, that uh, the projects that we need to get done are, get done, obviously housing is a, significant priority for the administration as well. Okay, so are there any uh, things you can give us to expect in the preliminary capital commitment plan? Are there any highlights that you can share with mm -hmm. us today? The number one thing we're asking for the agencies to do is to redistribute their capital uh, plan to for realistic time uh, frames for when projects will actually uh, begin and commitment start. Uh, and you'll be seeing an update on that. And I know that, that we've worked with you guys uh, and, and with uh, your committee uh, to uh, make sure that, that the plans that we have for capital are realistic and reflect when things can actually be done. Okay, okay, Chair John, if it's okay, I just have one quick question uh, and it's important based on a hearing that we had on Monday. Um, it's related to an issue that uh, the Women's Caucus and the BLAC and many of us feel very deeply about on maternal mortality and maternal morbidity. Unfortunately, in New York City, African-American women and Latinas and birthing individuals are more likely to die during childbirth than any other class of, of women. Um, it's been an issue that we've been focusing on in dealing with doulas and midwives and making sure that our healthcare system is equitable to all birthing individuals, uh, regardless of what you look like. So if you guys remember back in July of 2018, the administration announced a three-year, uh, almost $13 million investment starting in fiscal 2019 
on four initiatives that reduce maternal deaths and life-threatening complications of childbirth among people of color. Uh, there's a maternal hospital quality improvement network. And during our hearing on Monday, DOHMH could not confirm whether there's a plan to extend the funding of this program in the outer years. Um, and so given that the funding is going to come to an end uh, this fiscal year, I was wondering if you could confirm if there is an extension, is this on your radar? Is there a possibility that we can continue on this investment to really address some of the systemic issues that we face when you talk about uh, maternal mortality and morbidity in New York City? We recognize this is a very critical issue, a very critical health issue. Yes. And uh, we are we we are we are committed to supporting that initiative. We'll continue again, as I said, there is currently money in the budget after the third year, and we'll continue to make sure it's funded. Okay, great. I'm holding you to that, Director. Thank you so much. <laughs> really no appreciate it. Thank All you, right. Chair Drum. Thank you. Of course. Ms. Ruiz. Yes, now we have questions from Councilmember Adams. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Director, for being here today. Um, I, I've said many times that uh, many leaders uh, in, in our uh, city agencies are invited to hearings and they choose not to come, uh, but you are here today to take questions uh, from us and for that we thank you. And, and just speaking, uh, rewinding back again to the lean sale in which we are very, very involved with right now and still moving towards uh, some sort of uh, resolution. And again, we know that we've got a long way to go uh, with this uh, negotiation. Um, uh, I, I've mentioned in the past about uh, this being personal for me uh, because of where I live in Southeast Queens, because of the high foreclosure rate in Southeast Queens, because of the fact that uh, I consider myself, I won't say a victim, but I am uh, a property owner who, uh, you know, again, uh, has lived next door to a foreclosed property for way too long now, way, way too long now. Um, how many properties have been foreclosed on after having lien sold in the lien sale since uh, 2017 or so? Uh, uh, I think, uh, let me have uh, Jeff uh, answer that question. Jeff? Yes. So I don't have um, statistics specific since um, to 2017, and we can get back to you, council member, with that information. We do know that um, pursuant to uh, a task force that we met, with the council a couple of years ago that we did a review of liens that were sold and the rate at which they were foreclosed upon. And at that point, we came up with a rate of under 2% of the liens sold had been foreclosed upon. We, we can revisit that and we can certainly um, come back to you with a number specific for the liens sold since um, 2017. I would appreciate that much. Are the foreclosures limited to a certain area or areas of the city? Uh, no, no. The lien cell does not target any community or any race. Okay. Uh, however, as I, you know, we have a main discussion, uh, um, talk about, discuss, there are some ongoing financial inequities, okay, in around the city, which means that uh, certain communities have high delinquencies because of these uh, underlying inequities, okay? So, but uh, in general, this is not the policy of the city and to target uh, to the lien cell any particular community or any particular race. And how long does the foreclosure process usually take? It's a long process, uh, but Jeff could provide you more details in terms of the timeline, Jeff. Yes, so, the foreclosure process, once a lien is sold, uh, a foreclosure process um, can't begin until seven months have passed after the sale. And typically the foreclosure process can take um, up to two years from start to finish. And, and what we find is that oftentimes 
if foreclosure has started, then arrangements are made during the process um, for some type of payment plan so that the foreclosure process um, will cease. And can you give us uh, an idea of the legal fees associated with foreclosure? So the fees generally are court imposed fees and they vary based upon the court that's involved and um, based upon what specific steps are required. For example, there's a process server fee. Um, the cost of that fee depends on how many people have to be process served. Uh, and there, are, there can be advertising fees that will depend on which newspapers the court requires advertising to be placed in. So the, um, the amount varies and it depends on how far into the, the process a property um, has progressed and um, the prescription of, of the particular court. Okay, and, 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 and just, you know, considering again um, that in, in tremendous number, uh, lien sale foreclosure, um, communities of color are hit the hardest by this. Uh, liens that are sold are heavily concentrated in communities of color, and these are the same communities that are hit hard by predatory lending, which uh, the director just alluded to, high rates of foreclosure, which, we, which we've just discussed. Um, it's been suggested that the lien sale is effectively a gentrifying tool um, that leads to displacement of longtime homeowners and renters in community that are already facing uh, extensive marketing pressure, and now we've got COVID also. Um, how would you respond to this? And do you believe that the tax lien sale as it's currently structured that we are now working on exacerbates the problem as it places additional and unsustainable financial pressure on occupied low rent units leading to the loss of those units as affordable housing, something, a goal that all of us are reaching towards right now? Uh, I would say that uh, um... The court structure as is, um, we, uh, we discussed, we think that we should uh, definitely do a lot to improve it, and which is what we're working on. And one of the important things that uh, it's, uh, we have to do, it's again, it's one of the byproduct of the lean cell, is uh, the fact that you have um, bad actors reaching out to different people in the different communities and basically uh, put pressure on them so they could sell their properties. So one of the actions that I think we, uh, we're working on with, uh, with the council is to uh, secure legislation in Albany to have a cease and desist, uh, some kind of legislation so that in certain uh, zip codes, okay, brokers and buyers and you know, the bad actors cannot okay, use the linser list to call people okay, and put pressure on people to sell their properties. And we're also working to see how best we could codify into law certain uh, uh, um, uh, uh, certain things so that we could deal with uh, deed fraud because deed fraud is uh, one of the major issues in those communities, and we have to codify into law to make sure that uh, uh, people are protected uh, from those uh, bad actors. Again, we all agree that there are certain things that we can do. And we will continue to work with, uh, with you and the council and to secure uh, legislation in Albany to protect to as best as we can, okay, those vulnerable property owners. Thank you. And I'm just going to uh, throw one more thought in here because I know that there are a lot of people that want to speak and I want to give them an opportunity to do that. This year, you know, as you mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Budget Director, there's been no lien sale. Um, in my opening remarks, I actually thank the governor because there's been no lien sale um, and we've been on pause. However, it appears that the city has been able to shrink the lien sale eligible list to the smallest in recent history. So it appears that uh, perhaps the most successful lien sale year was in the year where there was no lien sale. So I just want to get be on record for saying that and I'd like to know if you uh, or your staff have shared uh, any lessons learned by this, um, by this process? Yes. 
that's allowed the yes. lean scale to be reduced so, by so much? Yes, we, again, as I said, outreach has been, you know, even though we couldn't do physical outreach, but the staff of the Department of Finance has, has done a tremendous job in terms of doing online, a lot of online outreach to make sure that uh, we reach the public. The other thing also, we also have to recognize is the time. Okay, we have a lot more time this, you know, like, you know, in last this year than in previous years, because in previous years, the process would have stopped, okay, in August. But now, you know, that process has been extended to December. But again, as I said, we reach, we learn a lot, okay, our best to target to do a lot of outreach and to work with uh, community leaders and elected leaders so that we could continue to work together to make the outreach stronger. Thank you very much. I want to thank you again uh, for your testimony. And again, uh, I just want to reiterate my commitment to this process, to these negotiations, um, my commitment to actually break the back of the lean sale uh, as much as I possibly can for the benefit of all New Yorkers who have suffered the torments of this practice. So thank you very, very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I will now call on the remainder of the council members to ask questions in the order in which they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. The Sergeant at Arms will keep a timer and let you know when you may begin and when your time is up. We will now take questions from Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Cornegie. Starting time. Thanks. All right, thank you. Nice to see everyone. Hope you're all safe and healthy. Um, thank you for the testimony. Um, this is just for OMB Commissioner. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about like long term and health, health of the city and next year's budget as well. And I just a couple of questions just to help me think through this. So first of all, just keep the projected budget gap for next year for fiscal year 22. What is the projected bid budget gap right now after you've done some savings? Uh, right now it's about $3.8 billion. $8 billion? We put eight billion. Oh, I'll talk about that. And um, and what what is the current strategy to fill the gap that that number for next fiscal year? Uh, we just uh, completed uh, the November financial plan. We are now in the process <clears throat> of reviewing every single one of our options to see uh, to come up with a roadmap uh, to uh, because the budget will be balanced. The question is, uh, what are the different options we will put on the table to uh, to get it done? Okay. Um, again, as I said, we uh, continue because of uh, um, we know it would be a very difficult budget because at the end of the day, unless we secure uh, a stimulus from the federal government, okay, we'll uh, we'll have to make uh, some very uh, uh, difficult choices. Uh, that's what we keep uh, stressing the uh, importance of federal aid to localities, because at the end of the day, the uh, different options that we have in front of us, they are not very appealing. Yep, okay. But if, so, needed, but if needed, if needed, we have no choice, okay? We had a plan, we have a plan, but if needed, we have no choice, but to the extent that we could avoid uh, to, you know, any major disruption uh, to uh, services and to avoid layoff, we will continue to work very hard to, uh, uh, with uh, all uh, the uh, uh, elected officials in New York to make sure we secure uh, federal aid to, uh, for the city. Okay. Let's just talk federal aid for a second, and I have another question, which is, how much federal aid do you anticipate the city is going to receive? What, what, what are we asking for? How much do you anticipate to receive? What's the timing of that? And um, uh, will that come directly to the city, or do we anticipate that goes to the state? and we get a portion of that? Uh, at this point in time, we don't know anything about the detail of, uh, there is a, uh, we know for sure there is a, there is a plan uh, going on um, uh, DC, but at this point in time, we don't have any detail in terms of the content of it. We know they're discussing about $160 billion for state and localities. How is it gonna be distributed? We don't know because we don't have the details at this point in time. So I can't tell you for sure one way or another. 
uh, uh, I'm a true in timing in terms of timing, and uh, they I know they're pushing to get it done this year, but again, um, we still don't know because, uh, from what I understand, yesterday, uh, um, there was a pushback by uh, Mitchell McConnell yesterday, basically asking, uh, to remove uh, state and localities, um, and uh, those items that they believe are contentious again. They have discussions at this point in time. I cannot tell you for sure what's going to happen. Okay. okay. Right. So, so I, you and I are both saying the same thing, which is I think there's a, you know, a lot of uncertainty. And I'll just be my last question. A um, lot of uncertainty. Uh, a lot, lot of uncertainty, timeline, and amount of money. Timeline. The election so, in Georgia. In so let me just let me just finish it. Let me just finish with this question, Um uh, uh What are, are there new revenue sources at the state level? If we have uncertainty at the federal level or at the city or state level that we're uh, looking at or pursuing or that you're most excited about as an opportunity to help fill that budget gap? Uh, one thing for sure, uh, uh, the, um, the city's economy is uh, performing a little bit better than we anticipated so far. So, uh, so there is a chance that we could get uh, uh, um, higher than anticipated revenue. Okay, I don't know how much it's going to be at this point in time because our folks are working on their forecasts. But uh, again, um, with respect to the state, uh, the state is in the same boat that we are. The state doesn't know for sure. Okay, what's going to happen? Uh, one thing we know is that the state has. Uh, threatened to use its authority, okay, at this point in time, basically to cut up to $8 billion, okay, uh, from uh, the city. At this point in time, I believe they have cut uh, $2.4 billion. I mean, they have postponed payments to localities of $2.4 billion, of which the city shares about $800 million. At this point, it's a cash flow issue because it's not yet, the state has not yet made the decision whether or not they're going to cut uh, the city's budget. They just postpone the payment. Uh, hopefully, we all will receive uh, uh, federal aid, and in which case, this will not be necessary. Well, let me just let me just end on this. I, I, I'm a little concerned that all we're saying here is let's hope that federal aid comes and it comes soon and it comes to New York City and it's the right amount of money and it fulfills our wishes. I think all of that is great. I just don't think it's likely. And so I'm concerned that we don't really have a strategy or a thought or a plan around what oh, no, we no, might no, no. go ask for no, if that's the case. And, and that's that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is I think we should be also thinking a little bit. I haven't heard really, to be honest, a strategy I'd say for borrowing for new revenue sources that might be available at the city or state level. And I, I still don't you know, truly hear some big ideas or thoughts about where the city might go find that revenue if it becomes unavailable at the federal level? Uh, the budget will be balanced, okay? The budget that we presented in uh, in January will be balanced, for sure, okay? The question is, from our perspective, is uh, um, can we avoid to make some um, major, major, major cuts, okay, to city services, okay? And that's the debate, okay? In terms of a plan, we we have plans to get to to balance the budget, you know, because of the budget has to be balanced, whether we have federal aid or not. Okay, so it's a question of how painful do we want to make it. So what we're saying to you is, if we have federal aid, okay, if we secure some federal aid, okay, there would be less pressure on us to do uh, draconian cuts to the budget. Okay, but uh, we have plan we have a plan we have a roadmap in terms of how to get to uh, where we need to be we will continue to work with uh, labor unions okay to secure savings uh we will continue to do attrition okay uh to uh, we will continue to monitor all our expenses we will consolidate operations of the city okay we will streamline our operation as much as we can the question for us is whether or not this is from our perspective a last resort okay we will explore other ways to cut the budget to, i mean to balance the budget but uh, you know to the extent that we could minimize uh, those uh, uh, cuts 
we will try as much as we can to secure federal aid. But it's not like we don't have a plan. We do have a plan. Okay. I'd love to see that plan. I would, I, I, I would, I, I'll assure you that we have a plan. The preliminary budget is coming out in a month, month and a half. So we, and it will be balanced. Okay. I'll, out of respect of, of all my colleagues, I'll, I'll stop my questioning there. Thank you to the chairs. We will now hear from Councilmember Cornegie, followed by Councilmember Gudenchik. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Budget Director Jiha. I feel like uh, we spent a great deal of time uh, the other day going over this, and I hadn't changed your title, so I owe you an apology uh, there. It actually has a pretty nice ring to it. So I I've worked with you on third party transfer, on deed, death, and deed fraud. Um, and I just feel like um, you know, just focusing on the lien sale and not the conspiracy around escalating energy costs, rent moratoriums, deed, death, and deed fraud, tax lien sale, and now third party transfer conspire to actually displace black and brown homeowners from their homes in a way that's never happened before. And then you couple that with the pandemic. Um, so I'd like to hear from you who I know to be someone who really cares about everything that I just said, because I've worked with you around it. I've appreciated the work that you've done. I want to hear uh, you explain uh, a little bit about um, how you're going to differentiate between those who are burdened through COVID and have relief for those homes and how the plan going forward with the lien sale would work. How do you differentiate and what's the criteria and how are we going to direct our people who are disproportionately impacted negatively by all of the things that I've said to, to, to get what they need in this process um, and, and, and make sure we set a precedent that says um, it doesn't look like we as a city are willing to bail out big corporations with tax breaks and not willing to give tax breaks to homeowners who are the backbone um, of this city. Uh, what, what's, what's the plan to differentiate? Well, it's, uh, it's uh, like, um, as I discussed you, uh, uh, with you on many uh, uh, occasions, um, we recognize that um, a lot of people are hurting in New York City, okay? And uh, one of the things that we did not have in the uh, last uh, um, uh, framework, in the last uh, uh, tax lien framework that we had, was the ability to remove folks who were impacted by COVID. Unfortunately, we didn't have that because COVID didn't exist, okay? We heard all the concerns, okay, from a lot of elected officials based on our conversations with them. And we recognize the challenges. And as a result, what we're proposing is uh, to remove anyone that is impacted by COVID, okay, from the lien sale going forward. At the same time, we also recognize that all the inequities, all the challenges that you just mentioned, we need resources, okay, to tackle, okay, to provide for, to, uh, to, 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 to service. We, we can't do all of these things Okay, tackle all the inequities, whether it's school, whether you name it. Every single one of the I'm problems that we have, we need resources to deal with them. So that's the reason why we're saying on the one hand, okay, okay, we understand the challenges, all the concerns that people are raising with respect to the tax lien sale. Okay. And for that, we're going to want to make sure, okay, everyone who was who, impacted, okay, by COVID or have other issues. We created a number of payment plans, okay, a number of options, so that we could get these people into those payment plans, or if they are impacted directly by COVID, to remove them. But at the same time, we also need the enforcement tool to make sure that the commercial property owners in New York City pay their taxes. Because if there is no enforcement mechanism, there is nothing that's going to push them to make payments. A, go, a big, I mean, a, a number of people would not make payments. And if they don't make payments, okay, the city would not be able to provide the critical services, okay, to the people who, are most, who most need them, okay? So this is what we're saying we have to balance, okay? On the one hand, we understand the challenges imposed by the Lincel on the people, okay, who who don't have the means, who are poor, who are struggling. But at the same time, 
we need resources to help those communities. Okay, so that's what we're asking. That's the challenge we're dealing with here. Uh, I thank you for your response. I stand at the ready with uh, my colleagues who serve in districts that are disproportionately affected. Alika Amphrey Samuels, Adrian Adams, Danique Miller, like the zip codes remain the same uh, of the people who are disproportionately impacted. So I look forward to working with you in your new role to make sure that we can pre protect the most vulnerable homeowners uh, from this predatory practice, from the predatory practices that exist in the city uh, going forward as we've done in the past. Thank you. I appreciate it. We will now hear from Councilmember Gudentrick, followed by Councilmember Jonai. Starting uh, time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Director Jiha, it's nice to see a guy from Queens get uh, forward. Congratulations on your new position. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, you know, I, I do want to put on the record that I really do not believe that this administration has prepared um, for the financial storm that we're in. Um, we have been relying overly much on um, monies from Washington that are not coming, have not come. And uh, at, at the rate they're making progress in Washington, I'm not sure they'll ever come. And I, I just want to put that out there on the record quickly. Um, I know that you're in a very difficult position. Um, you're, you're the person that has to pay the bills. Um, I want to say also, uh, before I ask you a question, I noticed in documents that were prepared by uh, the finance staff that the only tax that seems to be increasing during this COVID pandemic um, and the ensuing uh, fiscal uh, storm uh, that has enveloped us is the property tax. It continues to go up. Um, it's like kind of like death and taxes, you know, the old saying. Um, I, I do want to uh, also um, follow up on something that my colleague Adrian Adams and happy birthday to you, Adrian, um, said uh, earlier. She had asked about percentages and um, she'd asked about the numbers. And um, one of the people, for, I think it was uh, Deputy Commissioner Jeff from finance, um, said that it was under 2%, but unless we know the actual numbers of people affected, you know, there's a big difference between 2% of 100 and 2% of 100,000. Um, and I'm married to a math professor and uh, she says I'm very good at counting. So um, I want to ask you this question and I, I would like you to get back to us, whether it's finance or your office to get back to us on the percentages. Um, you know, why can't the city just take the money when properties are sold. Um, you know, I represent a big chunk of Community Board 13 in Eastern Queens, um, which has been one of the ground zeros along with Community Board 12 for uh, foreclosures. It, it's been a disaster um, for many of my constituents. I share that Community Board with Councilman Miller and um, formerly with uh, our new borough president, Queens, Donovan Richards. So, I want to ask you that question. You know, on Medicaid, Medicaid slaps a lien. They don't foreclose. They they reap their money such as it is once um, the person no longer owns that property or has has passed on. Why can't we do the same thing in New York City with our tax liens? Um, and and if we couldn't do it for everybody, why can't we do it for some people? There are a lot of people who are in my community. Uh, my aunt, for instance, I'm assuming she's up to date on her property taxes. Uh, my cousin, okay, my cousin takes a care of her, um, but she's been in the same house for 72 years. And that is not unusual to see in the, in the parts of Eastern Queens. I'd like a question, that question answered. Uh, Jeff? Sure. So I, I think addressing the, the last part is that uh, we do offer options for um, people who have been in the same house for a long time. And that's aligned with the PTA plans that uh, the budget director outlined earlier. So working with the council, we've created property tax and interest deferral plans. They, um, there were three types of them. One of them is specifically aimed at low-income seniors. So seniors who, um, have paid their mortgage and perhaps they're living on a fixed income, a pension, and 
they run into issues um, as the cost of things increase, including property taxes. We allow them to make a payment agreement with us where we're okay with them deferring their property taxes and they can pay a portion of the property taxes. And for the seniors, we allow them to pay as little as zero. And people in those plans are not included in the tax lien sale. And what we do is when the property changes hands, when ultimately it's sold, the city is able to collect at that juncture. So we have been carving out ways for people to do that. We do have our standard payment plans where people can pay as little as zero down and can stretch what they owe over 10 years. People in active payment plans are not included in the tax lien sale. And of course, the tax lien sale itself, we want to emphasize that our goal is not to sell the tax liens, right? Our goal is to run through a process. And as Council Member Adams was pointing out before, when we do the whole process, we end up eliminating more than 80% of the properties that are initially in the at-risk pool because they do make payments, make payment plans, and we end up not having to sell the liens. And then even for the liens that are sold, foreclosure cannot begin until seven months after they have been sold. So there too, the trust um, tries to enter into payment plans with people with, with sold tax liens. So in that way, we try to avoid entering into foreclosure actions. I appreciate that and I thank you for the answer. And if you could follow up with my office, perhaps we could do a webinar on that um, for our civic groups here in Eastern Queens so that um, we can get that information out to as many people as possible. I would appreciate Absolutely, that. absolutely. We, we very much would want to do that. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you, Director Jiha. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We will now hear from Council Member Joe and I, followed by Council Member Rosenthal. Starting time. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Director, congratulations. Just quickly, I want to follow up on the lien sale. Um, you made a statement that if there was no penalty, uh, people would not, if there was no penalty interest, uh, there would be homeowners that would take advantage of not paying real estate taxes. I don't agree with that. I do believe that anyone that owns a home wants to pay real estate taxes. Uh, the 13 council district, my district has the highest effective real estate taxes in New York City. In addition, um, during COVID, the borough of the Bronx was the hottest hit at the peak of 25% unemployment. The latest unemployment numbers for the city are respectively 18% for the borough of the Bronx, 13%, 13.3 for Brooklyn, 13.1 for Queens, 10.8 for Staten Island, and 10.3 for Manhattan. Those are a lot of homeowners that are unemployed. I can't see how they're going to be able to meet their tax payments, their real estate tax payments. So uh, the burden of lien sale and any penalty in interest would be doing right by those homeowners that have actually built this city. Uh, and they shouldn't be punished for being homeowners. They shouldn't be punished for losing their jobs due to no fault of their own, but because of COVID. Uh, before you answer that, you, I, you mentioned the federal shortfall for our budget. I believe you said it was $9 billion, Director? Yes, $9 that billion. Is, uh, we revised down our tax revenue short, uh, forecast last year by nine, um, $9 billion, yes. And you also indicated that there were increases in expenditures due to COVID, is that correct? Yes, yes. But I don't think you mentioned any of the federal reimbursement for the COVID-related expenses. Do we know that dollar? Yes, sir. It's about $3.6 billion. How much? For COVID, it's about $3.6 billion. So does that $3.6 that's how much we our federal. That's how much federal uh, uh, aid uh, increase in the November plan. 
But for COVID, it's about $2.8 billion. 2.8. So is that 2.8 or the total 3.6 taken out of that forecast? 3.6 is uh, it's, a, it's a bunch of other grants. It's COVID and other grants. That's federal That's federal grants. But 2.8 of that 3.6 is for COVID. But what is the total shortfall then? Because I'm not understanding the numbers, and I'm pretty good with numbers. What is the deficit that we're forecast with? For next year, we're looking at deficit. For this year, the budget is balanced, okay? For 2021, the budget is balanced. For next year, fiscal year 22, we're looking at a $3.8 billion gap, okay? This, the, 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 the revenue, which you, the, the federal revenues we're right. talking about here is uh, for fiscal year 2021. We're not talking about going forward. That's not, that's not uh, uh, for 2022. This is for only 2021, okay? Thank you. Thank you for that, Director. Okay. And before the follow-up uh, from the deputy um, on the tax lien to my question and the comment that I made, you're, all, you're asking us to consider everything is on the table to tighten our belts uh, in the event yes. of a shutdown, in the event of a further decline in our economy and tax base. My question yes. to you is, I was a part of the June uh, budget negotiations. I didn't see a single line item in there that referred to roughly $900 million that would go to the purchase of Alliance bus company. Where did that money come from? This is a pet project that miraculously this money appears when we had the most difficult budget while I've been serving on cutbacks. How many other pet projects are we not aware of that would be coming down the pipeline? If we're going to talk about cuts, let's first talk about expenses that we're not informed of. Are you aware of any other expenses, projected pet projects with high dollar amounts that the city council is not aware of? Well, this is uh, uh, not a pet project. This is basically is going to be, it's a substitution. It is basically we insourcing. Uh, expenses uh, that we currently have a contract for. So this is, this is not like a new, it's a, that <clears throat> whether you contract out that expense, $900 million over five years, okay, five and a half years, whether you contract it out or you in sources, you're gonna spend that money. So this, this is not a new thing. You have to have the transportation, you have to transport the kids uh, back and forth from, uh, from, uh, from school to home and to home to school. So it's not like a new thing. It's it's it's, it's a one is gonna replace the other. Okay. So, you, so but but in general, what you're saying, the point you're making, which is a bigger issue, a bigger point you're making, as I said, we're gonna scrub the entire we're scrubbing the entire budget. Okay, right now we're looking for every place, okay, where we need to uh, reduce spending, okay. Because as I said, it's not like we have a choice. Okay, on January 16th, we have to issue a budget that is balanced, okay. So therefore, if we don't have federal aid, if we don't have any other aid, that budget has to be balanced. And therefore, we have to make some very tough decisions to balance the budget. So therefore, we're looking at every single options. Okay, we're reviewing every single aspect of our operation to see what can be consolidated, what can be eliminated, where we have inefficiencies. Okay, we're trying to uh, come up with uh, a work with flexibility in a number of things that we need to do to ensure, okay, that we eke out every single savings out of this budget to make sure that the budget is balanced. Okay, so our goal is to say, we're saying to you is, we're hoping we could get federal aid, okay, so we could minimize, okay, the disruption in services that we think would happen if we have to go that route, okay, all right? But if we don't have any option, okay, these will be the things we will be looking into basically to make sure that we balance our budget because we have no choice, okay? Thank you, and um, Deputy, if you can answer uh, on the tax lien, The, with respect to the tax, I understand the concern you have with respect to property taxes are high and, and so on and so forth. This is a, a concern that we all share and we hear throughout the city. Uh, high property taxes, particularly in certain areas of uh, the city. And that's the reason why um, the mayor had convened the property tax from tax force and the, the, which came up with a number of proposals, okay, 
basically to ensure that we restore some kind of inequity uh, to the system. We'll continue to push uh, these changes in Albany, okay? And uh, so that we could see if uh, they get traction in Albany next year, okay, when the session resumes. So again, because we know we have to bring relief to a number of taxpayers in New York City. Thank you. We will now hear from Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Councilmember Ambry Samuel. Thank you so Probably much. Um, Director Jiha, congratulations. Uh, I feel you. like the city's in good hands. You really um, obviously care deeply about this. I want to ask two different trains of questions. One is, um, on, is the city, city still asking the state uh, to borrow money? I know it's not the topic of the hearing. I beg the chair's forgiven. Just no, no, that's okay. Say. That's okay. That's okay. Um, we always look at this as a, a last resort. This is not hey, an option. No, here's why I got you. I'm sorry. I am only because I'm very tight on time. Here's mm -hmm. why. If when you're when you're asking, will you consider giving the council the um, a, a list of what? I agree with you, but borrow the last minute. I mean, last effort, the last ditch effort thing mm -hmm. to do. But just when you're planning on doing it, will you be giving the city council finance team the list of items that you will be uh, potentially using the money for? Uh, as far from my perspective, from a Marco perspective, the only thing we would do with that money is to close the gap. Okay, I cannot tell you at this point in time which item we're going to purchase, what we're going to do, what service we're going to finance, because right. the, 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 at the macro level, the only reason we would use that is a yeah. last reason. There is no other way, no federal aid, nothing can be done. We would okay. look at this as a last resort okay. to close the gap. That's I all. Got you. Just I mean, when I the reason I ask, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to frustrate you, but when no, 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 we were no, in no, the no, budget no. office, what we did was produce two different budgets. One was a, a lilac budget. If you don't give us the borrowing authority, this is what's going to happen. And there was, I don't know, another one, that, a fuchsia one, that was, here's what happens if you do give us the borrowing authority. And I just urge you to contemplate doing that because I think you'll have a more compelling case with the state and certainly with me as a council member, if you're able to, to lay that out. But here's my question on the tax liens. Um, and I really appreciate council member Adams staying on this issue during the entire time she's been in the council. It's been extraordinary. Um, do you categorize the liens that happen? Do you, do you have them in different categories of situations? And, and I think we've talked about this before. So you have a category that is, we're trying to help these people and you're offering the different things. And then you must have another category that is non-compliant and never responded and we're moving forward. I would imagine those are sort of the two biggest categories. And I was wondering what is the relative percentage of each? Uh, I don't have that, that data, but I could ask uh, Jeff if, uh, if, he, if he has that, that information and could share with you. Jeff? Thank you. Yes. So, hey, hi, how are you, council member? Really good to see you, deputy commissioner. Pleasure is mine. So I guess before I go into it, we have been able to pull some information for council member Adams. So I want, didn't want to wait for follow-up. So since 2017, the city has sold 11,381 tax liens and foreclosure has occurred on 26 of, of that number. So that emphasizes, yes, it happens, but um, it's done to a, um, a small portion. And again, um, part of that is the process. And I think that's how I'd like to start to answer your question, council member, 
in that we don't formally do different buckets. Um, what we do is in the process, um, and I'm going to focus right now on class one, which I know is, is a central focus of, of the council. So you need to be delinquent for more than three years in order for us to even include you in the tax lien sale at risk pool. So age is certainly something that is a criteria that we use to determine um, whether to even include a property in that process. Um, and I know, um, a, as we've discussed, um, right now the threshold for class one and for um, most properties is $1,000. And um, the administration is discussing with the city council whether to raise that threshold. And, and I think that's something that um, we're amenable to doing and um, we're going to see where those negotiations lead. Once a property is in the at-risk pool, we do have the 90-day outreach period. And during that period, we are out doing as much outreach as we possibly can to all owners who are in that 90-day pool. So we, at that point, we don't say, oh, this one or that one um, seems to be recalcitrant. Um, we want to reach them all. We send um, the warning letters to all of them. Um, we place ads that list um, the, the BBLs, not the um, addresses. Uh, and we have outreach sessions with as many council members who will do a, a, an outreach session with us. Um, so we are doing all of that because we are trying not to sell any liens. We mean that. And we know by just running that process that lots of people are going to come in and they have, which was something that council member Adams pointed out. So no, um, once the liens are sold, then uh, the trust runs a similar type of process. It tries to get people to pay. And it's only after the seven month period, if people at that point have not uh, made any attempt to pay that foreclosure proceedings um, will commence. And, and again, as I've described earlier, those proceedings can last as long as uh, two years from start to finish. And during those proceedings, again, people come in. So we do feel like we need to have enforcement at the end of the process. People need to know that if they don't comply that this will happen, but that's not our goal. We don't enjoy doing it. We want it to be done um, as little uh, as we possibly can. And that's why it's such a long involved process before we get to that point. Right. So over the span in your answer, in the data you just gave to council member Adams's question, are you saying over the, in a course of a year, is it usual that there are, you know, roughly over 10,000 that are in the process, but then a de minimis amount that actually gets foreclosed on? Like if you looked at a five year window, would you see the same ratio? So just in other to... words, uh, with that, I mean, and if I could to its logical extension, that mm -hmm. would mean that around 10,000 actually figured something out and were not foreclosed on and the property owners got their property back. Am I understanding that right? So first, I just want to be clear about the numbers. So in the last three years, we've sold under 4,000 tax liens per year. So when I was um, quoting that 11,000 figure, that was for um, 2017, 2018, and 2019 combined. So I, I don't want to overstate the number uh, of liens that, that we sell each year. Got it. And um, so earlier in the testimony, we referenced that the last time we did a look back or we looked over several years, the number was a little under 2% where foreclosures were completed. So that would mean if you're talking about, for example, last year we sold um, 3724. So if you were to look back several years later, the number of foreclosures for that group would be roughly 74. 
and the remainder got their act together and started paying their tax worked out a deal yes that got basically it. yes they, they, there might be some foreclosures that stretch out longer but but yes and, okay. and so the number is lower for council member adams request because she was focused on the last three years yeah so it's, got yeah. it thank you for that explanation really appreciate it and thank you for the extra time chair you're welcome. We will now hear from Councilor Ambry Sandoval. Good Starting afternoon. time. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a lot of the questions that I had were already asked, and so um, you know, I, de I definitely echo um, a lot of what my colleagues have already expressed and shared. Um, I want to say to the director that um, I am thankful that. Um, there is a process happening now where you are listening to advocates and working with council member Adams to come up with a process that is meaningful and intentional and to make sure that we are not losing our communities. Um, I also want to state, um, because I don't have a question per se, um, I do have uh, just some clarifying questions, um, but I do want to say that I am a council member who participates um, in the informational sessions and they have been helpful in the sense of um, putting my residents, my neighbors on notice, and they will come out to the informational sessions. But what has been problematic is the fact that um, the end result um, is really about, you know, again, we've talked about it um, this entire time where there's seniors and people that are just, you know, struggling. And so there is no way for them to be able to um, make a lot of the payments that are required. And so we have to do more as, as more as far as being able to find those resources um, for my constituents, the ones who are struggling, who do come out and are notified, but just are unable to, um, to make those payments. Um, but I, just for um, clarification, although there was no sale, the city still collected and conducted the outreach efforts. What was the actual amount, like a dollar amount? I'm hearing like a different amount, like numbers and percentage and everything, but is there an actual dollar amount of the real estate property tax payments that was collected? Like a dollar amount? You might have said it already and um, I missed it, but is there a dollar amount? So I don't have the, the dollar amount. We can get back to you with that. Um, what I can say is that we started with an at-risk pool of nearly 19,000 properties, 18,907. And at last count, we had 3,010 that were still in the at-risk pool. So um, very good progress was made in reducing the numbers. Okay, I was just trying to get a dollar amount. Just to kind of, you know, we, we will get back to you with that. Okay, and another quick question. Um, just again, can you clarify, why does the city need to sell the liens into a trust? in order to encourage and collect. What's the, and I know that um, Joe Nye and Gradenchik also spoke to the trust and like the why, but you know, can you just really just quickly explain like the why that it has to go to the trust again? Jeff, you wanna go again? Sure. So the, the tax lien sale process was set up so that- Time expired. I'm sorry. Go ahead. It said time expired, but. Oh, okay. So <laughs> a trust was set up so that the city could create a separate entity that would be focused on this part uh, of the lien sale, could hire um, basically a servicer outside collection agency to. Um, ask those people to pay. And also the city has been selling bonds based on the expected revenue inflow off of those um, tax liens. So a trust was created to handle all of the financial transactions associated with transferring the liens, um, selling the bonds, evaluating the um, purchase price of the liens, and, and so forth. Okay, so Chair, um, as I'm um, closing out, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, I just hear time and time again that 
the trust does not run a similar process and it doubles or triples the tax owed for collection after the sale. And so, you know, I'm just hearing over and over again that, you know, it's, it's just, it, it just creates a, a, a problem that realistically, you know, folks in my community is just unable to get out of. And so I really hope that as we are revamping the, the policy, we're making sure that um, we're doing away with processes and systems that, that just exacerbated the, the actual problem. And I look forward to hearing the advocate speak today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you, um, Councilmember Amphrey Samuel. Um, and we'll follow up on that definitely. Uh, and I want to see if uh, Councilmember Adams has any further questions. I have no further questions at this time, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, again, I thank my colleagues for their questions, very in-depth uh, questions and the responses uh, thus far um, from, the, um, from the OMB team. I also look forward to hearing from the advocates. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. And I, I also wanna thank uh, the OMB team and our new director, Jacques Gia, uh, for your time here today. And uh, we'll be following up with you on a number of the items that uh, that we've mentioned. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to ask council to call our witnesses now, please. Okay. We will now turn to testimony from members of the public who have signed up to testify. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant Arms will set a timer and announce that when you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. We will now hear from Michelle Jackson, followed by Don Nash. Ms. Jackson, begin when ready. Start in time. Good afternoon, Chairperson Drum and members of the New York City Council Committee on Finance. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Executive Director of the Human Services Council. We're a membership organization that represents about 170 human service providers in New York City, and we do policy and advocacy on behalf of the sector. This year, as COVID-19 pandemic tore through every corner of New York City, uh, New York City human services contractors uh, were really on the front lines of a global health crisis, ensuring that high-risk populations such as seniors and the disabled had access to food, mental health support. We were continued to provide emergency childcare, um, to people who had to go to work, to other frontline workers, and we kept residential facilities that couldn't close open. Our workforce really put their lives on the line to ensure that New York's communities had the care that they needed to stay home, stay safe, and stay alive. Uh, while the human services sector really stepped up, unfortunately, our city government partners in the budget did not do the same. Um, when the budget was passed in July, there were cuts to discre some discretionary funding. There were, of course, the cuts to summer use uh, programs that we're all aware of. And also there was a cut to the indirect cost rate initiative, uh, which while something that's not program-based is really essential funding for human services, the cut was retroactive for FY20, meaning providers had to figure out how to make up lost revenue that they had already spent. And we're still halfway through the year, not sure how the FY21 funding initiative will play out. So providers have gone six months into the year trying to operate programs, not understanding exactly what money, if any, uh, will come of this initiative. While when the November plan came out, we were first happy to see that there were no further cuts to human services as we were one of the main uh, uh, victims of the budget in July. Um, but it's simply unacceptable that even though the November plan increased the current year budget by 3.8 billion, it did not reverse the damaging cuts to human services, including the cuts to the indirect cost rate funding initiative that impact city contracts, uh, contracted fine. human service providers. Um, so we're very, wanted to make sure we rose that issue, rise, you know, that bring that issue up today, um, that the city has really created some fiscal chaos for a sector providing critical safety net support for New Yorkers and would have liked to see that funding restored in the November plan, especially with so many other significant increases in the November plan. Happy to answer any questions and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. Hello, my name is Devon Nash, followed by Starting time. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Devon Nash, and my email is my first and last name at gmail.com. 
Um, the city um, roughly has 45,000 homeless families. Um, HPD pays out $6,319.04 uh, every year, I mean, every month. And I live in a building, I, well, I'm currently housed in homeless shelter with my, my nephew in a family shelter. And it's 165 units in here at $6,319.04. That comes out to be $1,042,641.60 per month the city is paying out. I propose that we give $2,500 according to um, Housing Connect 2.0, the site that you guys uh, have us uh, to enlist for, a two bedroom apartment is $2,499. You guys give out 300, that the city pays 500, and $50 plus an additional $168 for snacks every month. I propose that you can just give out $300 for, for, for meals and certain other things that a person may need. That's a total of $2,800. That will come up to $462,000 each month. You will say the city will save $580,641.60 every month. That's enough money that you can go and start helping with other people. There are 13,000 available apartments in here in the city right now. And we can fill those 13,000 apartments tomorrow if we just took some of the people out of the family shelters and just deposited them in at least a one or two bedroom or three bedroom apartment. And it'll save the city an awful lot of money. Uh, I know that you're new um, here, sir. Um, and so maybe if you wanna reach out to me, you can reach me at 347-237-8264. Uh, um, once again, that's three, four, seven. Uh, my name is Devon Nash and I'm a little nervous right now. I have all types of anxieties, so I'm a little nervous, but I'm a little calmer than I was the last time, but this is absurd. I've been in the show for three years and so far they paid over $227,000, $284,356 for three years for me being in the shelter. You guys could have bought a house for that type of money and there's no end in sight. And I would please, I would love to be out of the shelter system. It's just, it's just wasted money. All of the services that you have here in the shelter system, we don't even use them. I, honestly, I'm telling you, I wish I had pictures to show you the food that they feed us, that they, that they spend, did you guys spend $668 a month? I buy my own food and I spend $10, sometimes 15. And it lasts, and I, and I spend anywhere from 300 to $450 a month to feed me and my nephew. Thank you for listening to my, um, my suggestion. Thank you. And we're going to look at those concerns. We've been looking at them, as a matter of fact, uh, throughout the budget process. But thank you. I appreciate Let's it. Go. Well, did you think about uh, giving us $2,800 instead of for the rent? Because if you, it's 6300 That's just for two people. And there's other families with more people. So if you just paid the rent, and let's just, and oh, and the, the, um, the 2010 e-voucher, you guys, this is a voucher that helps um, um, people to take on people in their houses. But you guys only want us to use it for for the places that you guys made up. So it's like you spending more money on these other services that's really going not even being used. It's yeah. just a total waste, really. Yeah. I'm looking at these figures and I'm like, man, this guy makes twelve million five hundred and eleven dollars six hundred and ninety nine dollars and twenty cents a year just to houses, and he doesn't have to do anything else. Yeah. Now that's ridiculous. And yes. There's nothing wrong with us having an apartment, for real. I mean, I yeah. had an apartment, but because I, I, I'm a convicted felon, I haven't committed a crime since 2008, and I, I'm, I'm not on anything, but it's hard for me to get a, a place for my nephew and myself because of the convictions. They look at my, even though I graduated from college and everything, I came home in 2015, I graduated from college, and I haven't been in trouble, I held two jobs, I even started a business. Even with the COVID, I still do my own business. I sell water on Times Square. And I, I, I went out there this summer too. I didn't do, I didn't make as much because there's hardly nobody was out there. But you know, there were a few people I was able to sell a couple bottles of water just to keep some money in my pocket, you know? All right, well, thank you, Mr. Nash. I appreciate you coming in and giving the testimony. It's really important for us well, to hear. Thank you for taking my call. I appreciate that even okay. more. Thank At least you. now you guys thank know what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We will now hear from Aaron Weber, followed by Julia Durante Martinez. Starting time. Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Weber. I'm a small property owner in East Harlem, and I manage about 40 properties all across Manhattan. 
I want to bring an example to everyone's attention today. One building we manage on 23rd Street is an SRO, a shared rooming occupancy property. And there's about 20 units and there's three commercial units on the ground level. Neither of these commercial stores have paid rent uh, since March. And we have been experiencing a lot of delinquencies in our residential units up above. And we got our quarterly bill a few days ago um, and we're gonna owe $115,000 in taxes in January. Uh, we haven't collected um, anything near that um, in the past year. And we are grasping at straws. We don't know what to do. Um, even though we are gonna retain all of our residents and commercial uh, store owners, uh, we are not going through any eviction proceedings. We are waiting it out um, until people figure out their situations. We've been very responsible and um, safety has been our uh, utmost uh, priority and been working really hard throughout the pandemic to keep people in their homes. These is, this is a very vulnerable population and demographic uh, that are living in this particular building. Um, so I propose that for property owners like me that have been trying to retain their uh, residents, give Time us- Time expired. Just give us a tax break uh, coming in January that's proportional with the amount of rent we have uh, forgiven in this time period. Okay, thank you, Mr. Weber. We appreciate it. And uh, we're gonna go on to our next um, witness. Thank you. We will now hear from Julia Durrani Martinez followed by Jacqueline Griffin. Hi. Um, hi, good afternoon, committee chair drum and committee members. And thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julia Durrani Martinez and I'm the community land trust campaign coordinator at New Economy Projects. Uh, which is an economic justice organization that has worked for over 25 years to combat inequities in our financial system and economy and to promote cooperative community-led development. We convene the New York City Community Lands Initiative, um, which is a coalition dedicated to expanding community land trusts and deeply affordable community-controlled housing and neighborhood development in New York City. We urge the council not to introduce legislation reauthorizing the tax lien sale and instead work with community partners, including CLTs, to develop an alternative and equitable system to address property tax arrears and property disposition. Uh, the tax lien sale fuels speculation and displacement in black and brown neighborhoods and siphons wealth from communities that have been disproportionately harmed by historic inequities like redlining and disinvestment. This reauthorization bill presents no meaningful changes to this practice and would further compound financial distress for low income and black and brown New Yorkers and accelerate displacement in the midst of a deadly pandemic that continues to devastate and deepen inequality in our city. As community led nonprofits dedicated to the stewardship of land for community benefit, CLTs are ideally positioned to help develop alternatives to the lien sale that keep homeowners in place, intervene on behalf of tenants with delinquent landlords and expand the pipeline of properties for permanently affordable housing. And the more than 15 CLTs in formation in New York have developed their capacity to acquire property in recent years, including with support from council CLT discretionary funding. With the East Harlem El Barrio CLT's recent acquisition of four city owned buildings and the longstanding Cooper Square CLT, New York now has two successful examples of CLTs supported through the transfer of city owned properties. Particularly in the face of a looming eviction crisis and real estate downturn, the council must take swift action to prevent the transfer of distressed properties to Wall Street and other speculative buyers, and instead press policies to channel properties to social housing and community stewardship. Ending the lien sale and disposing of foreclosed properties to CLTs and similar entities, along with passing community opportunity to purchase legislation are two policies that can work together to achieve this goal. So we urge the council again not to introduce this bill and instead invest in proven community-led institutions that stem evictions, foreclosures, and speculation in black and brown neighborhoods and contribute to a just recovery and racial equity in New York City. Thank you. 
Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yes, Chair. Yeah, okay. I uh, just was wondering, you know, um, uh, what, what, what would be your reaction to the, um, to the director's statement that if we don't have lien sales, uh, people wouldn't pay their um, taxes? Um, so this is something that a number of the groups, uh, the community organizations that are part of the coalition to abolish the lien sale, um, which East New York CLT is coordinating, have done a lot of thinking around. I think the city has tools to enforce property tax payment. The fact that they've been able to collect property tax um, taxes in a year when there hasn't yet been a lien sale really helps to demonstrate that. Um, so we don't need to rely on a Wall Street backed trust to collect municipal debt. Um, and there's a number of other folks on the call who can speak to um, some specific proposals for how to improve that process, also work with homeowners um, but on better outreach. Um, and once it's at a point where there's property being disposed, work to make sure that it goes to social housing and other community-led entities. Okay, and I'm just curious to also hear maybe from some of the others also as well about replacement of the uh, lost revenue, how they would deal with that. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. I think again, just to note that the, the revenue that's collected through the lien sale is a vanishingly small percentage of the overall property tax revenue that the city collects. Um, and there's certain, certainly other areas of the budget that we could look to making reductions um, and instead invest those funds in communities. Okay, thank you. We will now hear from Jacqueline Griffin followed by Jennifer Levy. Out in time. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacqueline Griffin. I am a staff attorney with Brooklyn Legal Services in the Foreclosure Prevention Unit. I actually did kind of want to directly address uh, Director Jiha's uh, comment that the failure to reauthorize the tax lien sale sends the wrong signal to homeowners. Um, I actually think that there's a there's an issue at the core of that statement, which it sort of suggests that homeowners are not moral actors and that they are strategically not paying their property taxes. And I work with homeowners. I have worked with them for many, many years now. And the vast majority of the homeowners that I meet are eager to meet their obligations um, and they would meet their obligations, but for the types of financial difficulties that we all face, um, death of a spouse, a divorce, um, severe illness of a, of a family member or a child, and all of these difficulties, things that we face, all of us over the course of our lives, have been greatly exacerbated in the time of this pandemic. And as much urgency as there seems to be around signaling to homeowners that DOF's authority to sell their liens remains intact, I think it's much more important to our neighbors that we demonstrate urgency around helping them in the middle of this crisis. And the best way to do that would be to not rubber stamp uh, the process of the lien sale, which we've all acknowledged is not working. We've acknowledged that it is, is, it is exacerbating harm specifically to, communi to communities of color, specifically to senior citizens and the disabled. And so I think the best way that we demonstrate urgency is to come around the table as advocates, as the Department of Finance, as counsel, uh, to be thoughtful about, be thoughtful and careful and compassionate and, and take to heart the legitimate complaints of our neighbors and friends. Um, it does not, it is not reasonable to sacrifice the most vulnerable members of our society at the altar of revenue. And there's no justifiable reason um, why the I'm burden inspired. of carrying this city through this economic crisis should fall on the shoulders of those that are least able to bear it. I will only say that, again, as, as my colleague said before me, we as advocates have, been, have spent hours and days sitting around a table talking about an enforcement mechanism that takes into account the objective of collecting revenue, but also places a high value on protecting the vulnerable and granting people the dignity of keeping the homes that they've worked for and paid for. And so we are asking this committee to look at not just what happens in the next year, which as Director Jiha talked about is so uncertain economically, but what we want our neighborhoods to look like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, because if we let this go forward, if we give them this blank check, then we may have consequences that we won't be able to undo later down the line. And thank you. We will now hear from Jennifer Levy, followed by Ivy Perez. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, this is Jennifer Levy. I'm an attorney at the Legal Aid Society in the Foreclosure Prevention Unit. As you know, the Legal Aid Society is the oldest and largest provider of free direct uh, legal services to low-income families and individuals in the United States, serving over, uh, over 300,000 individual cases in legal matters each year. While in the midst of a global pandemic, where as a result, home foreclosures will be on the rise, reauthorizing New York City's yearly sale of tax liens without adequate protections for the city's most vulnerable will further exasperate this crisis by putting several thousand low-income, elderly, and disabled homeowners at risk of losing their home. Although the bill reauthorizing the tax lien sale provides for some carve-outs to protect those who've been affected by COVID-19, it fails to also pr protect the thousands of low-income, elderly, and disabled homeowners who live in their one-to-family uh, family unit homes, but do not fall into the specific parameters set forth. Specifically, most homes in New York City are valued at more than $250,000 and therefore would not qualify for this exemption. The pandemic and its economic consequences have devastated low-income homeowners, especially those whose tenants who've stopped paying rent and who rely on this rental income to be able to pay their property taxes and other bills. Many of our elderly homeowners are house rich and cash poor, living on limited fixed incomes, but whose house is worth more than $250,000. Although low-income seniors are eligible for property tax exemptions, many are not made aware of such programs, they don't know how to apply for those, are confused by the process, miss deadlines, and therefore are not um, able to uh, um, apply to be removed from the tax lien sale, even though they would be eligible. Making it even more difficult to navigate, eligible homeowners can only apply once a year. The city must protect and exempt these homeowners from the tax lien <coughs> sale. Instead of reauthorizing the sale, taxing sale through this legislation, the city should dramatically increase its outreach for homeowners. The city should allow for a relaxed deadline for homeowners to apply and renew property exemptions. The city should directly service delinquent property charges instead of selling them to liens uh, to a private trust. There should be a lower interest rate for owner occupied properties. Notices should have clear language that interest added to property charges when, uh, when they're past due. For the homeowners who previously defaulted on payment plans due to adverse circumstances should be able to continue to access those payment plans and other loss mitigation options. Most importantly, the city should not allow taxing foreclosures to displace vulnerable homeowners, such as the elderly, disabled, and veterans, because their debts can be repaid to the city upon sale or refinance of their homes. The Legal Aid Society believes that the city should not reauthorize the taxing sale without these protections, especially without providing an exemption for owner occupied one to three family homes. We commend the city council for considering this important issue and we thank you today for this opportunity to testify. Do you have numbers on the uh, number of um, elderly, disabled, and um, I'm forgetting the third category you said now that are actually included in the lien sale? I do not. Um, so do you, how do you make the, the um, assumption that they are disproportionately affected? Well, I can tell you as a legal services attorney um, practicing for over eight years, I've seen many, many of my cases are um, elderly homeowners here living in New York City who own uh, one to three family home units um, that rely on rental income. They rely on uh, just social security to get by and um, they are absolutely affected by uh, the taxing sales. And they, and unfortunately they, they, they're confused by the process. They miss the deadlines, like I said, um, oftentimes they send in paperwork and they may get a letter from the city and they don't understand how to then send in, uh, you know, whatever documents are missing. A lot of our seniors uh, don't speak English as their first language. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We will now hear from Ivy Perez followed by John Krinsky. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Ivy Perez and I'm a policy and research manager at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. I would like to thank Cher Drum and the members of this committee for hearing, for holding today's hearing um, and to council member Adams for, um, as council member Rosenthal said, not um, dropping this issue. Um, the center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class communities are able to live in strong, thriving communities. And every year, the center works to keep as many homeowners as possible out of the lien sale by conducting direct outreach to homeowners on the pre-lien sale lists and by co coordinating with our network partners to assist homeowners in obtaining a payment plan or a qualifying for an exemption. I want to address one of the things that has been said many times um, 
And I want to say that keeping homes from the lien sale does not mean foregoing tax collection. It just means doing it more slowly. Um, maybe there's no upfront payment to the city, but we know that the city will ultimately recoup a lot of their money for this because, in fact, um, there are some of the homes that are redeemed um, uh, from the actual trust most quickly. In fact, I think it's why the um, the trust the, these liens are so valuable for the trust is because they know that the homeowners will actually redeem. And what that means is it's um, the trust getting the leftover money um, because the trust only pays the city 70 cents on the dollar for those for those liens. So the city will get some of its money from the lien sale, um, but at what cost? Um, I also want to address um, Drum's, uh, Council Member Drum's question about why senior homeowners are disproportionately affected. Part of the reason is because um, homeowner, senior homeowners are more, like, more likely to have paid off their mortgage. Mortgage um, lenders generally pay off taxes, so it's often seniors that are um, uh, that have to actually pay their taxes and often don't know that they have to, um, and or don't know the process for doing so. And so oftentimes when um, the center reaches out to homeowners, the easiest thing that we do with a lot of these homeowners is just let them know that the exemptions exist and let them know that the um, property tax payments exist. Um, because I think- the, I'll finish quickly. Um, the 187 number who have signed up to PT aid, I think is illustrative of the fact that PT aid is clearly not sufficient for um, actually helping these homeowners. Additionally, the COVID-19 carve out in the legislation that was proposed is also for the reasons um, that Jennifer Levy and Jacqueline Griffin pointed out, also not going to help homeowners who already struggle um, to um, come up with the mountain of documents that they need to come up with in order to even prove that they're seniors and they deserve these exemptions. Um, and I wanna end um, finally by um, thanking um, Council Member Rosenthal for her questions about um, separating between the delinquent homeowners that need help and those that aren't going to pay. And that's exactly what we need to do before we continue the lien sale. These questions need to be figured out before we reauthorize the sale, not afterwards, not when um, families have already lost their homes to foreclosure or had to sell their homes in order to pay off their liens. A better way is possible. There was other cities do things other than tax lien sales. And there was a New York City before this tax lien sale. We've done it differently before and we could do it differently, better, more equitably again. Thank you. So you, I think you answered my question, but if you, if you, if you're um, on, if you get she or D, right? You're, you're exempt from the lien sale. That's supposed to be the case, but we um, find every year that sometimes homeowners that um, either receive she um, and re receive she um, end up on the list, even though they shouldn't have been. So it's a just quickly a matter of reaching out to DOF and telling them. But we also know that there's a lot of homeowners that struggle with even renewing their she. We know that there are more senior homeowners in the city, more low income senior homeowners than are receiving she and D. So. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people that don't get um, the quick help from um, the Center for New York City Neighborhoods and our partners could have just as like um, gotten an extension for their exemptions um, and gotten off the lien sale that way. Um, I think one of the probably one of the things that has been most helpful this year in keeping a lot of home homeowners out is that um, they extended the deadline slightly for homeowners to get the exemptions. So that probably right much to do with getting folks that didn't belong in the lien sale off of the lien sale. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, for that info. Appreciate it. Okay, let's go to our next witness, please. Brunel here from John Krinsky, followed by Cottrell Lewis. Starting time. John? Oh, sorry. I okay. just, I didn't realize that I was muted. Um, I'm sorry. Um, I, so uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, John Krinsky. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Drum, uh, members of the committee, and happy birthday, Council Member Adams. Uh, I'm a professor of political science at City College and a founding board member of the New York City Community Land Initiative, which Julie, uh, Julia Durante Martinez uh, introduced. And I'll submit written testimony on behalf of the initiative, but I'll just summarize their gist. 
On behalf of its more than two dozen member organizations, NICELY strongly opposes the renewal of the New York tax lien sale, uh, which does not fundamentally change the lien sale, even if there's a carve out for those who can prove that they were directly affected by COVID. The essential problem with telling, selling tax liens to a private for-profit trust is twofold. First, we've known for several decades that tax arrears are a sign of distress that likely extends to conditions in the housing as well. That the city takes certain distressed multifamily properties out of the lien sale and warns against predatory lenders on its tax lien sale website suggests that it already knows these problems but still thinks it's worth it. And that's the first basic problem. The second problem is that having the lien sale in place removes the incentive for the city to come up with more equitable ways to treat tax debt and the occupants of the housing that falls behind. By not privatizing the liens, the city retains leverage over the debt and allows the city to build on already active efforts like the 15 community land trusts around the city, most in neighborhoods that have greatly, uh, who have the greatest numbers of properties that go into the lien sale, sometimes year after year. Now, it's also important to understand that the models that the administration uses to judge the effects of the lien sale on tax compliance likely overstates the role of the lien sale as such in growing tax compliance. Indeed, if the city were, was seen to be as serious in enforcing its own tax laws as the lien trust is in collecting its money, there's no reason to believe that compliance would be significantly less. In addition, we have never seen an analysis that shows that the inequitable effects of the lien sale that we all recognize don't create economic burdens both for the risk and for the homeowners and tenants that it affects. In economic terms, the question is how real benefits or costs are calculated, not just as revenues, but as eventual expenses. So the tax lien sale is an obstacle to preserving land and housing for permanent affordability, whose real costs have never been taken seriously, and the economic effects of COVID make renewal uniquely bad timing and reimagining how we can deal with delinquencies even more necessary. Nicely urges a no vote on intro 6944. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We will now hear from Catrell Lewis followed by Hannah Anouche. Voting time. Great. Thank you, my name is Catrell Lewis. I am the director of Accuracy for Habitat for Humanity in New York City and a member of the Coalition for Affordable Homes. Um, Habitat for Humanity New York City has been building and preserving uh, affordable home ownership in um, New York City since 1984. So as my uh, colleagues are talking about um, uh, homeowners, I want to specifically talk about um, Habitat's sweet spot as it relates to the tax lien. Um, as of uh, November 9th, 2020, uh, New York City was prepared to uh, sell over 280 vacant lots within the tax lien, um, which represent, is represented by uh, your colleagues, 48 members of the council. Um, and that is to say that we are missing a huge opportunity as uh, many of your colleagues uh, have already stated, we are missing a huge opportunity to build our way out of this affordable housing uh, crisis that we are having rather than um, finding a new way to restructure uh, the tax lien and uh, at the end of the day, the city possibly foreclosing on these uh, vacant properties, um, the city continues to sell uh, opportunities for us to build on affordable, uh, on affordable home ownership and affordable housing on these lots. Um, I also wanted to say as it relates to preservation um, and you know, uh, council member, uh, Chairman Jum, I hope you appreciate these numbers. Uh, for every unit that we lose in the uh, tax lien, uh, it is uh, up to $190,000 that HPD is spending as it relates to um, the current term, uh, term sheet for building affordable home ownership. So in fact, when the administration is saying that we need this money, we're actually losing more money because for every unit that we're losing, we're actually spending more money from HPD. So in my opinion, I believe that the Department of Finance and, and uh, uh, HPD needs to get in the same room and have this conversation because um, we're losing a lot of affordable housing opportunities. Um, if I can, I required. wanted to you know, just speak to um, Councilmember Rosenthal when she was speaking about the foreclosure uh, issues and some of my colleagues can speak to this also. Um, as it relates to the foreclosure numbers, what we do not see in some of those numbers are some of the homeowners who actually sell um, before they get to a foreclosure. Um, so many of our homeowners actually sell before they get to the foreclosure. So that 26 number that the administration gave um, is not accurate. It is a lot of people that sell their homes before we even get there. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony.
We will now hear from Hannah and Shea followed by Albert. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah. Anushane. Good afternoon. My name is Hannah Anushane, Anushane, and I'm the coordinator of the East New York Community Land Trust, and I'm on staff at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. East New York is a nonprofit organization made up of community leaders and advocates who are dedicated to stopping displacement and protecting and actually building the generational wealth of Black and Brown people by taking community control of land in East New York. When we saw that Council District 37, which encompasses parts of East New York, um, had more properties in the tax lien sale than any other district, a total of 500 properties, we knew we had to take action. In the midst of the pandemic, East New York CLT members have called so many homeowners in this year's tax lien sale and partnered with tenants associations to knock on doors of tenants in extremely distressed buildings on the tax lien sale. We also convened a coalition of over 15 uh, community land trust CBOs, nonprofit developers, and housing advocacy groups, um, armed, you know, armed with the on-the-ground knowledge of how the tax lien sale actually harms both tenants and homeowners. For the last five months, we've been calling on the council to abolish the tax lien sale permanently. We've built strong support among community and elected officials, and we've actually developed a proposal um, that demonstrates. Um, you know, how the city could end the tax lien sale permanently, keep people in their homes and collect property tax debt and create more affordable housing. And we sent this proposal to all members of this committee. Um, that's why we were so shocked to learn on Monday that the city council at the request of the mayor would be considering the introduction of a bill that would renew the tax lien sale with extremely limited car carve outs. Um, we were even more shocked to learn that we had less than 24 hours to register to testify and just two days before the hearing itself. You know, I ask you to truly hear from and work with the community when it comes to this policy that will have a devastating imp and destabilizing impact on entire neighborhoods for the next four years, uh, you know, because this is not it. Um, so we call on this committee to not introduce this bill. We ask the committee to abolish the tax lien sale and work with us to establish a system that does not involve the selling of property owners debt to a private trust. And there are many examples to look uh, to look at nationwide. Many other big cities do not privatize debt collection. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And I know Councilmember Rosenthal has a question. Councilmember Rosenthal. Council member, okay. Messed up the unmuting. Um, I have to say, I'm I'm a little confused by this entire, I, I'll just be honest. Uh, obviously some of the toughest problems are, are the hardest to, to peel back the onion on. And, and I'm definitely struggling on this because um, everyone wants the right outcome. So, so, I mean, I don't, there's no ill intent by anyone. I would even argue the city in this. Everyone, no one wants people to lose their homes if they could stay in their homes. So maybe something that would help me and Hannah, I, I would ask you because you talked about going door to door uh, to people's homes. Um, and Chair, if I could beg your indulgence, perhaps there are others who have an example. Could you give me one example of someone whose door you knocked on, who you resolved the issue for them and they got off the lien sale? You know what, Helen? Yeah. Excuse me, council member? I was yeah. gonna ask that question. <laughs> so good, <laughs> we're thinking the same, good. Yeah. Um, I mean, so we are, you know, we're an advocacy group. So we were knocking on doors um, to, you know, talk to people who are impacted and, and share their stories so that they could come here in front of you all and share their experiences and share with the media. Um, that's really what we were doing, you know, because otherwise you don't hear from, from folks. I'm asking you um, to share one story. So tell me about one person whose door you knocked on and, and what was their story? Why was their property in the lien sale? 
Sure, sure. So, um, so actually, there's a homeowner who I think is trying to um, speak during this testimony. Um, he's registered to, to testify who can speak to that. Um, I mean, I think people, there's a number of things that happen. Um, people have, you know, are dealing with ongoing repairs um, and they're not, and so they're trying to pay for those repairs while dealing with, you know, the, these high interest debt. That's one issue. Um, there was an article that came out yesterday in the city where a homeowner is talking about how they had eight deaths in their family and they never received no notices from the city. Yeah. Uh, and I they mean, were put in a terrible position. Yeah, no, there's no debt. No one's questioning that, right? I mean, no one, those two examples are good examples because if that's true, then my question is, to Jeffrey Shear, you sent out five letters. Let's look at the, the letter with the address on the letter. Is it different than the homeowner's address? Like where's the disconnect so, so that this would happen? It's, is it, and it's fine if this is the answer, is handful of, you know, city government, city government not doing a great job. You know, um, so I don't know, maybe maybe Mr. Lewis has some ideas to help me here. I, I would just say I am in the middle of Council Member Emperor Samuel and Council Member Carnegie's districts. Um, outside of a pandemic, uh, Council Member Carnegie has, um, and many of your colleagues can tell you, they have these uh, you know, outreach uh, sessions where, you know, you can have a whole gymnasium full of people and the Department of Finance. And what happened, I went last year uh, for my first time to do um, outreach to some of my neighbors. Um, many of them never received the paperwork. Um, and it was Councilmember Carnegie through his session that um, the brownstone, the, the Bedstock brownstoners knocked on people's doors and brought people out on Saturday and got them into uh, payment plans. So, you know, when the administration says we do um, really good outreach, right, what you're seeing right now is the legal service to providers, the community engagement providers, these are really the people that are on the ground that get the people into the payment plans. It's not the city, with no offense to the city or the council or the administration. It's really these advocates that's on the ground that's able to knock on people's doors. So I felt that last, last year when I was with uh, Council Member Carnegie and a team to knock on people's doors. And a lot of people said, I just never received the paperwork. I never so, received the email, I never received go, the, the mail. Th thank you for that. Thank you so much. So let's go through their numbers. I mean, and again, apologies. I, I don't exactly remember what the deputy, what the numbers were. And council member Adams, maybe, maybe you can help with this. I'm gonna get it wrong. But there was some thing where he said, you know, under 5% actually land in foreclosure, right? Which means the property is taken away from them. And the rest of the people seem to be suffering somewhere in the middle, but nothing's happening yet. So, so for those people who actually get foreclosed on, do you know any of those people? And what's their situation? I have not. I, I would, uh, you know, speak to my legal service uh, colleagues. I know that um, we do see that there are some people that um, solve this issue by taking out personal loans or predatory loans, um, which I know, you know, your colleagues on the state and in the council uh, does not want people taking those out. Of course, of course, no one wants them to take a predatory loan. But I mean, and and you know, why is it that? I mean, what is it that Deputy Commissioner Scher just doesn't know? So he says out loud, you know, uh, we offer, or the trust offers these low interest, you know, 10 year long payments. Where's the disconnect? I can send you the report from the Coalition for Affordable Homes that show that the trust actually puts a lot of debt onto these homeowners. Um, that is a first, you know, start. I think what we can also um, start off with is that um, the administration is not a lot of my colleagues. You know, when they get that uh, information as it relates to uh, the tax lien, it's a lot of my legal service provider colleagues who are um, sitting with them and determining, you know, what is best. Um, 
Jacqueline uh, Griffin can uh, speak best to PTA aid and you know what she is seeing on the ground. But a, it, it is a hardship that a lot of our colleagues have to face as it relates to if you're a senior, um, yeah. the city should just say, we know that you're 65 years old, you are, the, you are not qualified to be in a tax lien. But some way or another, there are seniors still going to Jacqueline saying, I'm in a tax lien. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Last question, um, Councilmember Drum, can I ask you, is it the issue that the trust that the city, well, or differently, can the city or the city council require that the trust not set predatory loan rates? Or was that what the commissioner was saying? Well, if you don't have predatory loan rates, people just won't pay. I don't think, I don't think that's what the commissioner was saying, but I have to research that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be an interesting- And I'm, I'm interested in the 5% question as well. Yeah. I think that that is really where our concern, where we're most concerned are those folks, you know, who are those folks and why? Yeah, thank anyway. you so much. Thank yeah. you, Chair. Sorry. Okay, thank you. I, Let's, thank you, Councilman. Go ahead. I thought I might take an opportunity just to jump in and, and tell you what I see in my work since I'm most closely working on the front lines with a lot of these homeowners and, so I'm just gonna come up with some examples as they come to my mind. I, I once had a woman in her 80s who came to me, she was on the tax lien sale uh, list and she had actually tried to resolve it on her own. She had gone to uh, one of the outreach events where you have to show your ID in order to get into an installment agreement. Um, but she was not told that she was actually entitled to the senior citizen homeowner exemption and had been entitled to it for the past 20 or so years because of her advanced age. And so she was really struggling on her fixed income to make these higher uh, these higher property tax payments than, than would actually have been required of her if someone had informed her. So I think there's actually a very large education piece in terms of what the frontline staff of the Department of Finance um, are, are telling people when they come to them and ask them for help. And um, I, I will say that in terms of people that I've seen that are pretty far advanced in, in the foreclosure process, they are um, very often, again, selling their homes to avoid the actual foreclosure. Um, which has its own complications because at that point the value of their home is going to be depressed because it is a known fact that they are in foreclosure and so they're going to get much less out of their equity. And also what you're seeing is that people are entering into predatory loans because again, it is, it's, it's known when someone is in foreclosure, it's known when they're on the tax lien sale list. And so it's very easy for them to be targeted uh, by people who just tell them lies and tell them to transfer their property into the name of an LLC and give them a hard money loan. And then a year, two years later, after not making any payments, but uh, accruing interest on this loan, they still go into foreclosure and lose their home. Um, and I think the other thing that it's important to note is that there's a real disconnect between this sale and what happens afterwards. So you can tell someone, this is your 90 day, your 30 day, your 60 day, your 10 day notice that you're on the lien sale, but they don't really understand how that translate in, translates into a foreclosure action seven months later. So they get these bills, these urgent bills, oh, this is a 10 day notice, but then the next bill that they get from the Department of Finance has a zero on it because they've started, they've started over. And so a lot of people start getting these letters from your, your tax lien sales servicers and they are not really understanding who these people are or why they now have their loan. There's a, there's just a, a very, a lack of understanding. Um, sorry, I feel like I wanted to say one more thing, but now it's fallen out of my head, but I, I would love to talk with anyone more and more and more and more about, about the issues that I've seen. And I guess I'll, I'll just do one more example because it's particularly egregious. I had a blind man um, who was the victim of, uh, of deed fraud. Uh, again, because he, he owned his house free and clear, he had um, accrued some tax, some tax debt because again, on a fixed income, sort of struggling to make ends meet because he slowly lost his sight over time. And so his neighbor targeted him, said, I'll, I'll pay your, you know, I'll pay your debt. We can fix up the house. You'll get part of the rent, et cetera. Convinced him to sign some paperwork that he obviously wouldn't have been able to read. Mind you, this man for many, many years was walking into the Department of Finance Business Center with his 
Cain with his indicating that he was a blind person and no one told him that he might be entitled to an exemption based on his disability. And those are the types of things that I see over and over and over again. And I'll, sorry, I want to I want to talk about heirs too because I think that's a that's going to be an important point in COVID because so many people have died, which means a lot of homeowners that are on the deeds to their homes are are deceased now, and so their heirs are going to have to face this. A, the economic loss, but also the possibility of trying to enter into an installment agreement. And I've actually talked with Commissioner Shear about this a lot, about uh, the way that they are applying the, the law that permits an heir to enter into an installment agreement and how I feel it's not being accurately applied as it was intended to be based on Local Law 147, which was passed a number of years ago. Thank you. I'm going to put it back to Council Member Drum, who is muted. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry. Okay. I, yeah. Uh, I just found out that the interest charged by the trust is the same as the city, which is currently 5% for most homeowners. So I just wanted to give you that information. Okay. Let's go to our next witness because we really are falling behind in terms of time here. Yeah. We will now hear from Albert Scott, followed by Deborah Ack. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, good afternoon, Chairman Drum, Finance Committee members, and Council members that's on this call. My name is Albert Scott, and I'm with the East New York Community Land Trust. Uh, I'm just uh, and also a resident of East New York all my life that has been um, really impacted by this uh, tax lien uh, sale, um, being the number one um, on the list in the Council District 37. Um, my message is just is very simple. Abolish the New York City tax lien sale. Abolish the Rudy Giuliani legislation. This is just simply a speculation tool on, on that enriches on the front end, uh, Wall Street, and then also the um, bill collectors. And then on the back end, it also enrich, enriches the, um, the private invest, investors and um, speculators. But more importantly, year after year, what we also see on this particular um, list is how it impacts Black, Latinx, and Asian council districts. Uh, year after year, the top 10 districts is either represented by a Black, a Latinx, or a Asian council members. So, and we know the detrimental harm this current process has on a community's of color, so why reauthorize in its same form the same process or encourage this tool, which we view as a speculation tool and a displacement tool of communities of color? It's impacting again Black, Latinx, Asian um, um, council districts, and it's impacting communities of color, as was um, mentioned earlier. And we have a great opportunity to actually abolish it and there is something new that could actually be in its particular place in which uh, my colleague stated earlier in regards to a report that was given out. Thank you for your time and your attention and your consideration. Have a good evening. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Deborah Ack followed by Boris Santo. Start in time. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Deborah Ack, and I also am a member of the East New York Community Land Trust Initiative. I was one of those people who were going out into my community, knocking on doors, speaking to homeowners, speaking to also tenants, because tenants are also affected by this tax lien sale. Um, unfortunately, we had a tenant, Carlos, who was supposed to speak but unfortunately due to the short amount of time that he was informed of this meeting, he was not able to take off for work. He tried to get in during work hours, but he couldn't. But if you want to read his story, his story, the city wrote up an article about him and the tax lien sale. What I'd like to say is that I'd like for the city council to stop the speculators from living, from lining their pockets on the backs of our black and brown community residents. This is way before it gets into the, the sale of or, or on a, or, or, or however it, 
it gets to the end. It's the beginning part that's scary for us, for our residents in East New York, especially for our seniors. Um, you have this tax lien sale list that gets that the speculators get a hold of. You have so many people calling these homeowners, threatening them, forcing them, tricking them to sell their homes out of fear our seniors and people who are on this tax lien sale are selling their homes out of fear. Um, also, um, I'd also like to speak about um, the homelessness um, due to the fact that the East New York CLT has proposed an alternative to this tax lien sale. The East New York, the CLTs can house homeless people. Time expired. Take some of these people out of, out of this homeless shelter, which the city is paying, like the gentleman said earlier, these astronomical amounts for these people to stay in it. I'm asking you to review and look over again to the proposal that the East New York CLT, that the coalition gave to the city kind of the city the finance committee the council committee look over this proposal um i'm a longtime resident of east new york and i believe in east new york i believe in a change and it's time for a change thank you for your time and thank you deborah we will now hear from boris santo followed by memo salazar good uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Chairman Drum, and um, all the other council members. Um, uh, happy birthday, Council Member Adams. My name is Boris Santos. I am the treasurer of the East New York Community Land Trust. I want to start off by saying tomorrow or December 17th or any 2021 future stated council uh, calendar days could prove to be sad days in the history of the city council. Uh, we know that the bill language that has been introduced would extend the predatory taxing sale until 2024. Um, and the only exemption that this bill gives to class one property owners, owners of one of three unit homes, um, is, uh, is if your home is in a, has an assessed value of 250,000 and you have experienced financial distress and have income less than $150,000. To say that this exemption, the only exemption that has been inserted in a reauthorization bill is restrictive is not an understatement. That exemption, first and foremost, only takes place for 2021 lien sale. According to this bill, most in black and brown small homeowner communities notoriously harmed by the lien sale have a property with an assessed value that's higher than $250,000. Um, and the lien sale program, which was originally set to expire in 1997 and was extended in 1997, 1999, 2001, 2004, 2006, 2007, 2010, 2014, and 2017 is bad policy and should not be allowed to be continued at is being proposed at the request of the mayor right now. Um, I must give three reasons for why reauthorization should not occur. Um, some of these were points already were um, stated. Um, the Abolish the Taxing Sale Coalition has met with city council finance and various council members and, and has requested meetings with many more, many who have not gotten back to us, Mr. Chair, about alternatives to the private trust model that exists today. In fact, we have spoken about during a uh, New York City taxing sale think tank hosted by, hosted by Council Member Adams um, on October Time 19th. Expired. We have spoken about those alternatives. Um, and uh, our coalition has a report laying out alternatives. I bring this point out just to debunk any perspective that anyone has that we're just shouting about this lien sale without providing any alternatives towards the existing model. That is not the case. Please allow me to continue um, just two more points. Um, approving this reauthorizing bill runs counter the strategy that we have been putting in practice with regards to the 2020 lien sale. The governor has postponed that, has postponed that sale um, after doing so several times through the executive order until the new year, um, because after all, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Postponing that sale further will also be something the state executive further considers. So why are we aiming to reauthorize future sales when we have not even settled on what to do with the 2020 lien sale? Um, and then lastly, there should be no reason for why this should be extended until 2024. City voters are to elect a new city council along with a new mayor by 2021. They should get the right after being newly elected to determine the future of any new lien sale. This is common sense. I want to end by saying that that point that the director brought up or the OMB contact, oh, I'm not sure if it was here or the director, that um, 
this uh, trust is required for us to collect property taxes is bogus. We have done property taxes collection before effectively are doing it. So now effectively, as CM Adams stated, um, this year constitutes a year where the folks in, in the lien sale has shrunk to the most drastic degree. And being that this year is the only year where a lien sale hasn't taken place and we're still collecting effectively property taxes, it really shows that it can be done. And again, really, really, council members, do your homework, look at the report, look at our alternatives, meet with us, be genuine in that meeting. And, and, and I look forward to the end of, uh, towards the end of not reauthorizing, working with everyone, including the OMB director. So thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Memo Salazar, followed by Jan Ling. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. My name is Memo Salazar. I am a co-chair of the Western Queens Community Land Trust, uh, as well as a filmmaker and a small business owner in Queens. CLTs have been in vogue around here lately. Uh, both the mayor and the controller have spoken passionately about CLTs in recent speeches. There's also been huge news stories in Oakland and Philadelphia that have proven that CLTs are great solutions to tough housing issues that were also political hotbeds. This year has also given us the biggest economic crisis in recent history, and come January, we will begin to be the biggest housing crisis since the 70s. If you're wondering how to solve it, the answer is pretty obvious. CLTs and other community nonprofits are uniquely positioned to help the community weather the storm but we need money, land, and properties. Giuliani's tax lien sale system is designed to make a few real estate insiders rich at the expense of everyone else, especially black and brown people, as well as the elderly, as many folks have already pointed out. It hands over much needed land and properties to savvy developers who play games and cash in on gentrification at our expense. <clears throat> Studies show it has also contributed to our skyrocketing homelessness problem. If you do the math, the $87 million that the city makes every year from selling off liens doesn't even begin to cover the $2 billion we now spend on homelessness <clears throat> services every year, which means that supporting this lien sale isn't just racist and immoral, it's also fiscally foolish. Our citywide coalition representing all five boroughs has a solid alternate proposal that we've shared. And on a fundamental level, handing an essential public role to a private trust that's beholden only to their shareholders is painfully corrupt. Why would any council person want to support such a system? If you want to be on the right side of both history and the balance books, please let this racist system die with 2020 and replace it with one that benefits communities and not private investors. Thank you. And thank you. I know council member Adams had some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, ju I just really, really wanted to jump in. Um, and Boris, I, your enthusiasm is always amazing. Let me just put that. <laughs> let, me just put, let me just put that out there. But I wanted to make sure because you all are so important to, to the whole picture and the whole piece of this collective pie. Um, don't mind my dog in the background. She's having a moment. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure that, that you all just really, really understand, um, I, because I can't push this anymore, that the legislation is a placeholder. We have a long, long, long way to go with all of your input still ongoing, helping me to negotiate this stuff, helping my colleagues to help with this negotiation um, you know, for this process. Um, and like I said before, we are all trying to effectively break the back of this Giuliani thing. So I, I just wanted to put that out there again, because it just, and I know that you, you are, and I want you to make your points, believe me, because the world needs to hear your points and everybody needs to hear why this is just so wrong. You know, it, it, it's, it's just so wrong. Um, the effects of this for our seniors, for our, for our black communities, for our Latino communities, our Asian communities is just so wrong and unjust and everybody needs to hear that. So I just want, to just, you know, um, you know, in my own little way, um, you know, on my birthday, that's really not been a great one, but um, uh, <laughs> I've got three events, <laughs> three more meetings after this one that we've been on for about three hours now. But I just wanted to, you know, um, uh, to, to reassure you, we are all, you know, as the chair said, we want the same thing. You know, we want the same thing. And it, it, it is my utter belief that nobody wants anybody's homes taken away. 
you know, um, it's just this process, this horrible process that's been put in place um, that has done so much harm that we all effectively have to work together to fix it, lose it, whatever it is that we have to do. So I just wanted to put that back out there again. Hi, Control, your testimony was amazing. Deborah, as always, amazing. Sam Adams, I just want to say I, I heard your recommitment at the beginning and I'm, I'm not taken as a betrayal or anything. I want to continue working with you. I know you follow up in that commitment. I know this is not even, this is probably the pre-beginning, if even, right? If we yeah. think it, if it's even the beginning. <laughs> um, and I want to say, look, you know, we just want to make sure that it, it's not reauthorized at the back of Black and Brown Small Homeowners, yeah. which you know very well. I hear here's, you. One, uh, here's one idea. What about you reauthorize, but only for class four properties for that private trust model, right? So We're like, there's, on like, there's ways to work it out, but we will. And I'm confident that we, we will. will. Thanks. We will. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for indulging me. Of course. Next, please. We will now hear from Jam Lee, followed by Lyric Thompson. Thank you, Chair Drummond. The time will begin now. Thank you, Chair Drummond. Thank you for your, your wonderful and, and very heartfelt uh, uh, comments, uh, uh, Council Member Adams. I, I want to caution the uh, council that the Department of Finance uh, and OMB has sort of painted a picture about the past, about this being relatively small and, and you know, the, there's only 26 foreclosures. Don't believe any of that information because it is old information. It is pre-COVID information. We are about to embark on something we have never seen before. Now is not the time to try to fix a broken issue. Now is the time, as uh, Albert Scott had so eloquently said, we need to reinvent a new thing. This vestige of predatory, uh, a, a, a predatory practice is not something that we need to start putting a Band-Aid on and started trying to find it. Nothing is the same after a global pandemic. And so we should not rely on the Department of Finance to say, well, in the past, this is what we did. It didn't work. I'm telling you as a person who represents Asian small property owners, who has talked to Latinx owners and who has talked to black owners, it is not working. I have gone to the Department of Finance with other small property owners from my community. The Department of Finance has not been able to process even the lowered interest rates from Council Member Chin's bill, which was to lower the interest rate from 18% to 7%. Do you know that our property owners still have not been acknowledged for the applications that they made back then? So please don't buy into the Department of Finance and OMD saying, this is working fine, we just need to tweak it a little. No, nothing is the same after a global pandemic. So please, I know you have the intelligence and I know that you have the wherewithal and the caring to reinvent something that is absolutely new. And I'm encouraged by Council Member Adams, your fierceness and your willingness to look at something new. The time has expired. Is absolutely the spirit that we need to look at all of this. The communities, my black and Latin ex owner, brothers and sisters, they are suffering. We as the Asian community, small property owners, we are next on the list. So just be aware, I'm representing lots of small property owners who are of Asian descent, who are immigrants, who are absolutely next on your list if this is reauthorized for the next four years. Please push it back. At the very least, this should not be looked at for 2021 at all. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Lyric Thompson, followed by Paula Siegel. Hi. Your time will begin now. Hi, my name is Lyric Thompson and I'm in Council District 37. <laughs> and my building is also on the uh, tax lien list. Now, when I think about how did our building get on the tax lien list, it boils down to HPD allowing bad behavior. We're in a 421A building that was never completed. It was in year eight of 421A by the time I realized that we were 421A and rent stabilized. The landlord was trying to clear the building at that point. I stopped that from happening. As TPU was closing in on this guy, he drop sold the building to a new guy. The new guy lost the 421A exemption and subsequently entered into an agreement with HPD that he 
submitted forged documents that were given to him by the other owner. Um, these documents HPD has known about since 2016. HPD has known about the forged documents within the 421A application. And I can't help but think that maybe had they addressed that, the new guy wouldn't be in the position that he's in. And we tenants wouldn't be in the position that we're in. I feel like I'm in hunger games, to be quite honest. I mean, where, where do we go as tenants? What are we supposed to do? Why is this city throwing us to the wolves to give developers a free pass? Can someone answer that question for me? Anyone, anybody in the council? And it's an actual question. The fact that no one's saying anything but me is really telling as to why we have issues with housing. I really have nothing left to say. There is nothing more to say other than the fact that when you guys make all these false promises to people, to tenants, when, when those promises don't come true, your words cease to mean anything. Then there's- Your time has expired. There's only bigger and better lies. Okay, next please. Yeah, next please. We will now hear from Paula Siegel followed by Jason Boker. A fucking um, Hi everybody, thank you so much for- Your time will begin now. Thank you for inviting <laughs> our input on what I understand to be potential language for a bill that has not been, re not been introduced and I'm here today with a simple message um, on behalf of our partners, on behalf of Take Root Justice, where I work as a senior staff attorney in our equitable neighborhoods practice, and on behalf of tenants like Lyric, who are being left behind by a system that is not designed to protect New Yorkers. The city council should not reauthorize the city's lien sale. Uh, we should be looking at the damage that has been done by the liens that have already been sold and working on reversing those, not talking about selling any more of them. It's time to put Rudy Giuliani's ghost to bed. Um, I want to address a couple of things that the department said earlier. Um, the behavior of the tax lien trust administrators through the pandemic is illustrative of the anti-civic and anti-New Yorker attitude of the trusts. Since courts reopened for new cases this summer after being closed in March, 2020, as part of the governor's pause, um, the, the tax lien trusts have initiated over 1,125 new foreclosure cases. I'm sorry, am I, is, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear oh, wait, you. Sorry, my internet has been going in and out all afternoon and this is really important. That's 1,125 new foreclosure cases that have been fire, filed by the tax lien trusts since courts re reopened in June. Um, that is not 26 cases. What Deputy Commissioner Shear is talking about is judgments of foreclosure from that one specific year of sales of cases that have gone all the way through the court system, right? Where a case was filed, the owner didn't sell in the middle of the case. They didn't pay off the debt in the middle of the case. They actually got a resolution, which in three years for a foreclosure action, that's pretty short. Um, probably most of the 2017 liens that have turned into foreclosures are still going. So that 26 number has really nothing to do with anything. The time has expired. I've submitted written testimony. Um, I want to just share a couple of more things that the department was not able to answer really basic questions. They were not able to tell us about properties that get sold after a foreclosure is initiated. They weren't able to tell us um, how many have actually had an action initiated by the trust at all. They were not able to tell us about anything about how much money the city actually loses by selling the debt at 72 cents on the dollar. Um, the fact that the department characterized the, as not selling debt as a form of relief for property owners is truly offensive. And I really want to highlight that I'm here in support of our partners in the community land trust community and our clients who are calling for the redirection of properties to the production and preservation of social housing. And I'm one of the co-authors of the report that was submitted to the committee that presents alternatives. I want to thank the council for its 2017 requirement that the department publish 
a list of vacant properties that are going through the lien sale. Lien sale. That list for the 2020 lien sale is, is over 800,000 residential zoning square feet and buildable lots that we are letting slip through our fingers. Now that we have that information, let's take advantage of it. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Jason Bokar, followed by Lauren Mogul. Your time will begin now. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council members uh, and board. Thank you for um, taking the time to listen to our comments. Uh, my name is Jason Bokor. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm with a company called Metropolitan Refunds. We represent thousands of property owners in the New York City area in terms of utility uh, charge uh, problems. Um, we represent all sorts of um, property owners from small single family um, unit owners through large commercial buildings. And my comments will be addressed to DEP and the New York City Water Board shutting down practically all access to their building systems, which many of my clients now are calling us trying to figure out what to do about the tax lien sale. And we can't even check the charges. We have no possible way to check these charges that we used to have. We used to have access to the city, to the DEP system uh, through the fair tax system that was completely shut down. And now there is another online access available for property owners to register for, but uh, the data is much more limited. The access is very hard to obtain. If some board member registered uh, for access, that account is now locked up. You have to go through at least a three, four month process to regain access for another board member or the property manager to gain access to the billing. There's very little we can do for a client to check the accuracy of their bills, uh, which they've depended on, on us for 20 years already, we've, we've been doing this. And there really is a, 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 a big problem in selling water lien sales at this time without any real way to access the bills. You can't go down to a borough office in the COVID now to check the bills. It is a, a terrible system. It is done on purpose, we believe, uh, to shut down any type of contesting of the water charges. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. And it's informative to me. I appreciate it. Thank you. We will now hear from Lauren Mogul, followed by Ezra Peters. Hi. Your time will begin. Thank you to everyone that has presented today. It is clear that much thought has gone into the lien sale, both pros and cons. In listening today, I keep hearing that the payment agreements are offered as a way of protecting property owners from being sold in the lien sale, and that they are even offering a zero down option. What is not being said is that the DEP payment agreements also include a clause that by agreeing to the payment agreement, they're also agreeing to the open balance. And as such, property owners lose the ability to contest prior charges. It is basically a gun against their head. Sign this or we're selling your property into a lien. This is the very opposite of trying to help homeowners. It also states that all future billing must be paid on time. And if not, they are now in default of the payment agreement. If they're unable to manage the current bill, they will likely not be able to pay all future billing on time. And typically will end up in the same place next year on the same list. Another consideration is that DEP has removed all public billing information from their site. The only information that is immediately available online is the current open balance. This does not include how much is principal, how much is interest, it doesn't provide a payment history or any other billing history. DEP does offer some other information on a My DEP account, but the information is limited and only available to the person that the account is registered to. We have found in more cases than one that these accounts are registered to an old owner or someone else which limits the actual owner from getting the very limited information that is available on this site. In order to get access in this situation, they must write to the DEP, request access, and by the time they get a reply, the lien sale may have already been sold. The other option is to file a FOIL to obtain bill history and breakdown. This process can take up to six months to get results. The 90-day lien sale is a heavy burden that pressures 
the portion of the community that is already struggling and just continues to keep them down. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna take a look at the website, so thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Ezra Schwartz, followed by Mark Schwartz. Your time Hi, begin. Council members, for the opportunity to testify today regarding the lien sale bill. I work for a firm represent, representing homeowners, management companies, and landlords, specifically with their regard to their water bills. I have experience of 20 years working on New York City water bills, and therefore I understand that water bills and the New York City Water Board regulations are much more difficult for a homeowner or management company to understand than one would assume on the surface. With regard to the lien sale, it's obviously an important mechanism to exist as unfortunately many bad actors will not pay their bills unless there's some level of enforcement. However, the process needs to be fair. Since at least 1995 through May 2020, there's been a public access system that has a full billing and accounting history of every New York City water account. This system was available in DEP borough offices for anyone to walk in and use. It was also available to be used in private offices via paid subscription. The system was used by various different parts of the real estate industry, including banks, consultants, title companies, and management companies, and was very effective in providing oversight and transparency, specifically with regard to the lien sale, when customers are up against a deadline. In addition to the public access system, since approximately 2009, there was a DEP website available to all, which provided the last three years of bills to anyone who entered in a property's address. In September 2019, DEP emailed firms that paid for access to the system that they were closing the system going forward. This went into effect in May 2020 during the, during the pandemic. In addition, without notification to the public, without any public hearings in September 2019, they removed the public website that showed a property's water bill history. What DEP effectively did was take a public utility and public information and turn it private overnight without any input from the public. They're attempting to act as a private utility company that services a suburban community, yet they also want the power to sell liens on, on outstanding balances, a power which no private utility companies have. I have a copy of a press release in front of me from 2008 when the city council and the mayor approved the DEP Your to sell- Your time has expired. You, you can finish quickly. Okay. Um, in 2008, the city council and mayor approved the DEP to sell standalone liens. At that time, the public access system was available, as mentioned before, but the city council recognized that water bills were not a simple process, and therefore an extensive analysis was done recommending numerous changes to the DEP operations. Here we are in 2020, and the only change that has been made now is DEP closing the public access system while at the same time asking for the ability to sell liens. Councilmember Adams mentioned predatory behavior in the lien sale process. However, the largest predatory behavior I'm seeing here is the lack of transparency from city agency. We're requesting that the city council compel the DP to open back up public access, regardless if they want the legal authority to sell liens, but especially if they do. Thank you for your time. Is this issue currently in litigation? This, this issue is, yes. It is, okay. And uh, the issue is that uh, you as a company don't have access, but the individual does have access through their My DEP account? Um, one individual could have access, theoretically. Um, then as someone mentioned before, that access could be locked out if a different management company takes over. Um, the system that you have, that access is very limited in terms of information that exists. It's um, pretty much as limited as could get compared to the old system. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to look into it a little more. Thank you. Yep. We will now hear from Mark Schwartz, followed by Herschel Weiss. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank your honorable council members and city agency officials for your hard work on behalf of all New Yorkers and hope everyone is remaining safe and healthy. I serve as the deputy mayor of my township in Teaneck, New Jersey, and realize how hard these times are to govern. Indeed, the tax lien is an important, effective, and necessary mechanism used to assure fair payment by all and as a way to properly allow the city to run financially. Furthermore, the proposals promises and hopeful cooperation amongst agencies and governmental bodies is of course needed and we look forward to its eventual implementation. 
Our issues are with the water aspect of the tax lien. The water lien was a slow migration into the main lien tax process that began in 1996. When finally merged fully into the DOF tax lien sale in 2008, many changes were proposed and implemented. Throughout this process, two important DP matters remain steady. One, the DP CIS system remained an open system to the public, and two, the DP Ombudsman, Patrick Janikova, ran a fair management analysis unit open to help guide all potential lean eligible homeowners. The Ombudsman plan, the Ombudsman's plan focused on compassion. He would state that his goal was for not one lien to be sold, but rather every debtor be given a fair chance to pay what he was accurately do. Accuracy is the key here. Since the Ombudsman's retirement, the payment agreement, a very fair agreement offered by the DP, as detailed today by the director of the OMB, was modified to include one very important line. And I quote, by signing below, you indicate your acceptance of these terms and agree that the charges on this account are valid and cannot be disputed. In the last year, DEP has shut public access to their system. While New York City agencies and its administration has pushed ahead with its world-class NYC open data, with top-notch access to buildings, housing, and finance databases, DEP, DEP has gone backwards in time and locked out everything but balances. So now a lien notice is sent out, bills are inaccurate, full of penalties and interest, and information is severely limited. Rather than work with the customer, DP comes in as a super superhero and, as the director said, offers a zero down payment agreement. Just sign here. Your troubles are gone. No need for money now. But it's a trap. And I'm finishing in a second. You cannot fight the bill after. You must deal with it now, but you cannot get help from an attorney or relative, a community group or consultant because they are also locked out of the DP system. Foils take six months to review, but the lien sales in 90 days. It's a trap but at least DP gets their millions. This honorable council must change. Open up access to all, as has been the case for decades, and be, allow fair and ac accurate water bills to be issued to everybody. Thank you. Is part of the uh, reason for uh, DEP's thinking on this um, uh, confidentiality? Uh, these are water bills. Uh, why don't I have confidentiality on your tax bills, on your Department of Building violations, on your housing violations? What's water bills? Why is water bills different than what your payment number, your payments that you made? I can see what checks you wrote to the Department of Finance for the last 20 years. Why can't I see your water bill? What has changed in 25 years? Well, there are Nothing. there are people there are there are council members who will argue that, um, especially uh, on any of these tax lien sales that uh, predatory um, real estate folks are going to people's homes uh, and telling them, you know, uh, work with us and then winding up with deed fraud or whatever it may be. I'm just wondering, I don't know um, if that is an issue. I've, it's an issue I've never heard of because once again, we have access to, you, we, you, me, banks have access to your taxes, access to your building, access to the county register to see the deeds. Why hasn't that changed? Why is it just water? And if privacy was an issue, so block access to single family homes, blocking access to co-ops, to condos, to, ta to taxpayers, to multifamily buildings, to six family buildings. What are we hiding? I know what we're hiding. We're hiding 25 years of erroneous bills that keep being issued. Okay, thank you. We will now hear from Herschel Weiss, followed by John Mantel. Your time will begin now. Hello, my name is Herschel Weiss. I write a blog on water issues called waterwatchnyc.com. And we've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, I'd like to thank um, Chair Drum, my council member, Fred, uh, Farrell Lewis, and the DEP Commissioner Sapienza. Customers get in trouble for two reasons. They don't have the funds to pay their water bill or they don't understand their water bill, believe it's incorrect and assume that the DEP will straighten it out when they call them on the phone. Um, in the past, if these customers were astute, they were able to go find a consultant that could do two things. One, find out why the bill is high. Is it a leak? Is there a mechanical problem in their site? Is the meter being read wrong? Is the DEP wrong? Are they billing him for a wrong bill? 
Or are they just sitting with the new attributed consumption charges, which assume that all New Yorkers are thieves and hit them with tremendous, tremendous penalties in the place of a private home that can exceed $13,000 a year for somebody that the DP knows is not using the water. The DP's response, rather than become more transparent, as all the other agencies have done, um, Chair Drum has asked about um, information available, information available on everything that the DEP has, including how much water, benchmarking, they'll post it. If you're using too much water, they'll post it. If you don't pay the bill, they'll post it. Anything that's detrimental to you, they will post that publicly to shame you and to collect from. What they won't post is to tell you what your bill is, what happened in the past, what the meter multiplier is, how the bills, all the minutia that no one is interested, they say that's privacy. And they've made the argument publicly at water board hearings that these consultants or people will look at your water bills, find out when you're not home. Your time has expired. This is absolutely ludicrous. There's been a consistent plan to deny information to the public. The first thing about 10 years ago, there were notes that were available to the public. The notes said things like, I, the inspector, went to the site and see the meter running quickly. Well, somebody fought a lawsuit, won against the city, used the note, the city said, no more notes. Then there's data that's been available for 25 years since Ed Koch's early time. That data is now no longer available. Why? Because the customer is, wants privacy. The customer doesn't want privacy. The customer doesn't see this stuff. They don't understand it. The, um, the DEP then goes ahead and says, well, you can get onto our new website. Well, try to get on their new website. It's very hard. If you don't know who the user is, they won't tell you. And the user can be an old board member, it can be somebody else. No problem, send us a letter notifying us. I've tried this for large clients and small clients. When I send the letter in, they say, you know what, that's on the old deed. The guy's not on the new deed. Well, the old guy is dead. It hasn't been transferred to the trust yet. In the meantime, there's no answer. This is clear cut. The DEP is going after customers to hide their errors. And they've been doing this forever. We then finally said, you know what, we'll use your new portal, we'll get the data. They said, we don't want you to download that electronically. I called up and said, why don't you want me to, to do this electronically? He said, well, then you'll find a lot of errors. Well, so what they want you to do is to accept their bill on their trust that they're right, and mostly they are right, but when they're wrong, the customer has no idea, no way to get the information. They can't go to a professional. So they're stuck having to go to all these wonderful organizations like the Legal Aid Center for New York Neighborhoods, or East New York Community Land Trust, Queens Land Trust, Brooklyn Legal, and all these people can do is try to help them out financially. What they cannot tell them because they don't have the skills is, the city's been overcharging you, you don't owe them a penny. And that's what they're trying to stay away from. I ask if Commissioner Sapienza is still here, what is the need to deny this data? I really would like to throw that out to him or to Joe Muren, who was listening in on this, and to answer, what is the need to negate all this public information? Okay. We'll follow up on that. Uh, thank you. Thank I don't know that he is, but I know that the administration has a representative on the call. So thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from John Mantel. Your time will begin now. Thank you. Honorable city council members, city officials, and fellow advocates, uh, like many community, uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, we certainly op oppose uh, the reinstatement of the lien sale from a transparency and oversight standpoint, having access to the DEP system is certainly essential. We are called upon daily to assist our clients with matters pertaining to their DEP water bills. Because our access has been stripped, we aren't able to assist our clients with essential questions they have to rectify any open balance. As such, having a lien sale when client advocates aren't given the proper vehicle to assist with rectifying any financial obligations is simply unjust and unfair. Furthermore, 
with regards to setting up a payment agreement on any open DEP charges, clients are forced to waive all rights by agreeing to accept the validity of all charges. This is required in order to set up the agreement. The problem again is advocates aren't able to review the validity because our DEP access has been stripped. And so certainly again, another reason why we are against uh, reinstating the lien sale. Property owners who aren't of means could certainly become desperate, borrow money, potentially at a premium, to pay off their obligations to avoid winding up on the lien sale or worse, losing a, a multi-generational asset. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, I've heard the issues that uh, you are talking about uh, as well as some of the other folks who gave testimony uh, and that's it. So thank you uh, for all. Uh, I think this is our last person testifying, yeah. And let me just um, see if I have anything else to say at this point. I don't believe that we do. Okay, no. So I believe that I can just probably close this out. Am I right, counsel? Yes, that's correct, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. So with that, this meeting is adjourned at approximately 425 in the afternoon.